Transmitter device activating. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 Podcast, your weekly exploration of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters through the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our last three episodes where we did the 1972 JLA, JSA, plus the Seven Soldiers of Victory team-up crossover extravaganza. Mm -hmm. If you're a regular listener, you'll have clocked that we didn't do the usual thing where we chat about the story and do the contemporary correspondence, because we've saved that all up. We're going to do that all now, aren't we, Peter? We most certainly are. Yes. Yes. We're recording this episode two years to the day since we recorded part two of the 1967 JLA JSA crossover. That was issue 56 of JLA. So that's that's a nice indicator of how quickly we're getting through this. Yeah. Um, and at this point, I haven't heard any of our 100 to 102 JLA issue episodes. And at this point, I haven't finished editing any of the 100 <laughs> to 102 episodes. So listeners, you have us at a disadvantage. You'll know better than we do right now whether or not this is this great <laughs> folly, this great experiment, or this complete lack of sleep that Peter's had for the last three mm. weeks has been worth it. We hope it has. <laughs> yeah, jail issue 100. Can you remember the first time you read this storyline? Oh, crikey. That's a very good question that I hadn't actually prepared for. I oh, should have been. Excellent. Uh, no. I remember getting it. I remember seeing the striking cover, and I think it was at a comic mart in the early 90s. Right. But I didn't get all three parts for a long time. I think it took me a while to track down all three. Okay. And I can't remember where I got the other ones, but yeah, I remember getting that at a comic mart uh, and just thinking, this is fantastic. Mm. Great fun. Mm-hmm. What about yourself? I can't remember. Much like yourself, I think it was either probably at a comic mart in the mm-hmm. early 90s or from Mr. Root at City Centre Comics at some point in the early uh-huh. 90s. Or mid nineties. I do remember quite pointedly early on in my devoted DC fandom trying to get as many of the JLA and JSA crossovers as quickly as I could. Yeah. But it was like nineteen ninety nine before I got issues twenty and thirty, so anyway, shall we start then? Issue one hundred. Yes, let's just uh, have a wee look at yeah. all the pertinent parts of the story and we'll just go over it very briefly for you because obviously you've heard some amazing amazing dramatizations of them recently. <laughs> uh, perhaps not in this podcast, but you know. Um. <laughs> I love that the the JLA's old headquarters are just left to just gather dust and cobwebs. Yeah, the old tech. Yeah, that's pretty that's, cool. That's hilarious. Mm. As we know, it does return in various forms. Yeah, because the Doom Patrol used it for a while, didn't they? Yep, uh-huh. and I think the league actually went back to it as well and at Young one Justice, point. Yeah, huh? I think kicked about in it. I can't remember memory. Young Justice. Went there. I just Could remember them. I just remember them being in um, was it Mount Rushmore, or was that someone else that's based in Mount Rushmore in that series? It's been a while. There is an issue, I think, they're hanging out the front of Mount Rushmore. Mm. And like, um, there's a whole lot of explosives up someone's nostril and impulse shouts yeah. it's going to blow. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't remember. Anyway, that's we're already getting yeah. far away from the point. Um, mm. A bit surprised that everyone was so surprised that the atom came flying out of the telephone. You'd think they'd be used to it. you think you would, yeah. We should qualify for new listeners, which we might have picked up a few of recently. Uh, Aquaman's accent, we established early on that... Uh, <laughs> The Atlantean accent is kind of like Sean Connery. Yes, we did an issue of Aquaman a couple of years ago, quite a while ago now, where mm-hmm. um, Aquaman and Mera were sort of in disguise at a, a sort of coastal resort. And the whole story was obviously lampooning a lot of James Bond stuff. What was it called? From from Ogre with Hate. From Ogre with Hate instead of From, from Russia with Love. Ogre with Hate. Hate. Yes, we haven't sung that for a long time. No. So Peter, damn his eyes, decided to do <laughs> Aquaman as Sean Connery because it's funny, you see, and he has done it ever since. Damn his eyes, if you're wondering. <laughs> that's why. It does add a bit of flavour, no, let's be honest. Yes, well, absolutely. It's better than us attempting to do bad American accents for everyone. True, true. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so yes, that's the, the, the origin of that part. Nice to see the Flash and Elongated Man to me up. Well. Yes, that was great. Enjoyed that. And um, quickly must point out that the panel with the Martian Manhunter and a couple of moons mm. hanging above, that's a nice little callback to issue 212 of World's Finest. Oh yes, um, mm-hmm. which actually I seem to remember that finishes with the Martian Manhunter thinking that Superman has died, and nothing really seems to happen to kind of make him aware that that's not wow. the case. So we'll need to watch out if we ever do any more stories. Mm-hmm. It's been a while since I read that. Yeah, it was great getting some of these guest voices on for these because yes, yeah, if we got uh, comedian Robert George in to do Martian Manhunters. Thank you very much, Robert. Yes, we got a friend Max Traver from the Weird Warriors podcast to do Ralph Debney, and. Regular listener, Chuck Lawrence. Hi, Chuck. He was Earth One Green Arrow. And I must say, 
I really enjoy playing Hawkman, and it's nothing I'd like more than to act out a Hawk, classic Hawkman Green Arrow argument with Chuck. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Well, if we ever one day, up, Chuck, one day. If we ever set up a Patreon, that'd be the sort of thing we'd do. If <laughs> Chuck's got nothing better to do with his time. Um, <laughs> delighted that the Irredeemable Shag could join us as Metamorpho. Yes, that's fantastic. Um, really, really pleased. Mm-hmm. Thank you for doing that for us, because I'm a big fan of Shag's JLI podcast, and as Metamorpho is obviously quite a a foregrounded JLE guy. It seemed mm-hmm. like a lot of sense to, to get Shag involved. We're so glad that he did. And he absolutely nailed the character as well. Yeah. Well, I can't, I can't comment on that. At the you moment can't, you've not heard it. I've not heard oh, it. Yes. Um, I have heard, though, that, that Brandon Peters did a great job of Snapper Car because I heard the audio of that when it came through. So yes. I'm, I've mentioned Brandon's show on the, on the podcast many times. Mm-hmm. BrandonPetersShow.com whysoblue.com for his movie reviews, etc. I'm a huge fan of Brandon, so I was mm-hmm. delighted that he was able to help us out, so it was nice to have him in a snapper. And then my pal from work, Cammy, played both of the Gotham goons for us. That's true. So that was a lot of fun, mm-hmm. as a full moon loomed in the background. Yes. It is quite cool that we got a cutaway then to Adam Strange, who had been like an on-off guest star with the league, and indeed continued to be for a while, and then it kind of like dropped from the scene, really. Yeah. So it's quite cool that we got... Uh, a brief cutaway to Adam Strange. Yes, and thanks to Arion for doing that for us. That Arion's line was actually the first thing recorded for these episodes. <laughs> now, we're recording this episode on the 5th of July, right? Mm-hmm. And I checked. Arion's dialogue as Adam Strange was recorded on the 20th of February. <laughs> well, That's when we started. <laughs> 20th of February, 1967. <laughs> um, yeah, 20th of February, 2023, obviously. And... You know, we Pete and I started discussing the early part of the year, and that was the first bit of dialogue recording. There you go, Arion Zenos mm-hmm. is Adam Strange in, in the laundry room at SWG3. There we are. <laughs> then we have a lovely group scene where some of the heroes are all getting together in the cave, and Satana makes an appearance, played by played by my wee baby sister Ali. There Thank you are. very much. One thing I found really interesting in this scene is the flirtation straight away with Zatanna and Flash. Zatanna is basically uh, mega flirting with the Flash here. Which, yeah, it's not an awkward thing to play at all. <laughs> Which is fascinating considering, you know, much later on in the Bronze Age, you have got a bit of a situation after Barry becomes single again. Sure, tactfully put. Yes, uh, then there is a flirtation kind of romantic you know, connection there with uh, Barry and Zatanna. So it is really interesting that Zatanna seems to be definitely flirting with him in this. Cool. Diana Prince arrives on the scene. Depowered is not Wonder Woman at this point. Yep. All Emma Peeled and all karateed up. Yep. Uh-huh. Played ably by my wonderful wife, Christine. Thank you again for helping me out. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Christine, because it meant, it meant I didn't have to play both Wonder Woman, <laughs> which was good, because my voice was strained enough. Mm-hmm. Interesting sort of gender situation here at this point, because they leave it to the girls to, to cut the cake, to prepare the food. They do indeed. Mm. Green Lantern, mm. Hal Jordan, played by our good friend Gavin Ritza, it conjures up a giant cake slice. And I must say, this birthday cake, this birthday cake, for lack of a better expression, a celebration cake, is massive. I mean, how many people do you think they're going to feed with this thing? Well, maybe they were going to have, a, have some themselves and then take the rest around some hospitals or something. I like to think that's what they, what they would have done. Or maybe I'm, Metamorpho just would have eaten all of it. I'm expecting uh, Marilyn Monroe to pop out and start singing Happy Birthday, Mr. President. Really? Okay. <laughs> She's been dead for about 10 years at this point, is she not? Well, you know, anyway, sorry. Metaphorically speaking. Sorry, I'm spoiling it. <laughs> so everyone gets transported to Earth 2 and we meet the GSA. Mm-hmm. We got our pal Ross from Stop Let's Team Up to play Starman for us because Ross is doing a dedicated Starman thread on his podcast at the moment. So check out Opal City Confidential. Peter and I have both appeared on that. Mm-hmm. I've appeared on it a few times, but now I think, talking about various issues of the various stories featuring the various starmen. Dr. Midnight was played by my good pal, Kenny Smith, who I've known for quite about nearly 30 years now. <gasps> and I still occasionally contribute to Kenny's Doctor Who podcast, Power of Three and Pieces of Eighth. So you should check them out if you're a Doctor Who fan. Kenny's a sweetheart. And also the choice of accent for Dr. Midnight was because he's Dr. Charles McNider. He's a Mick. So yes, it's uh, yes. a Scottish heritage there. Yeah. That was sort of influenced by something Multiverse Historian had said on in one of his blogs that I'd seen, and then Gavin, when he joined us last year mm-hmm. for GLA 82 and 83, he played him as sort of Dundonian. Yes. Uh-huh. You know, Dundee listeners, <laughs> but Kenny's, Kenny favours Aberdeen more because that's the team that he supports. So we've established at least that Dr. Midnight's from the East Coast, so that's something. Indeed. And not from Atlantis. No. no. And we also had the Sandman as well, ably played by Rich Fulham of, again, the other Weird Warrior from the Weird Warriors podcast. Yes. 
Weird Warriors is a great show, listeners. It's almost like, you know, running contemporaneously to, to what we're doing. Mm-hmm. It, Weird War Tales was published really during the period that we're covering. If you enjoy our show and you're enjoying the sort of discussion of what's happening at DC at that time, mm-hmm. then Weird Warriors is absolutely essential. Yes. I'm not going to say sister show because it's not, but it's it's covering comics that are published at the, around the same time. And mm-hmm. both shows, I think, will reflect the changing attitudes and approaches that went on at DC during the yes. 70s and 80s. It's, it's, it's well worth checking out if you haven't. Very much so, yes. And our good pal Steve Higgins joined us to play not only Johnny Thunder, mm-hmm. but also Crimson Avenger mm-hmm. and Stripesy. Yes, more on that later. Yes. The question that I really have to ask after all this time, you know, who is Oracle and why did he never come back? Because <laughs> <laughs> he came in and you had to do lots of talking. Yes. Which gave me a rest for a few pages. That's very true. Because, you know, he knows everyone's name. Mm-hmm. And I know it's one thing, actually, in the prep for this episode, because I didn't really pick up on it when we recorded the episode, because mm-hmm. I wasn't doing his dialogue. Oracle has a line where he says something about, where is it now? Those you pursue may no longer be what once they were. So I think that's him referencing what's happened to Speedy a couple of issues early. Oh, interesting. Yes. That may well be, huh? I think that was what was going on there. Because mm-hmm. um, no one else really gets transformed or anything. Mm-hmm. That was quite an yeah. interesting thing that I, sort of, that I didn't pick up on the first time round. Oracle does also state that uh, they are alive, but considering they were all sent back in the past, then they would be dead by now. Well, if they had remained in the past, yes. <laughs> in theory. So, you know, it's well, he's looking at it fi- way, well, no, he's, he's, he's looking at it fifth dimensionally. They've been displaced. Mm. It's that whole thing. If you think about it fifth dimensionally, everything that ever, ever happened is yeah. always happening at the same time simultaneously, and you can just hop about between it. So that's obviously what he's thinking of. Mm. We should talk about the actual threat to Earth to this giant hand. Yes. That's, that's grabbing it from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah, it's, it's interesting because they don't really labour too much that it's Earth 2 that's under threat. Uh-huh. Throughout the subsequent chapters, you just get Earth under threat and this weird disembodied space yeah. hand. Mm-hmm. You know, is the wrist sort of just emerging out of the ether, as it were, or is there a giant unseen body as well? So I want to know. Yeah. This story is often referred to as the one where everyone shows up. But they don't. Yes. There are some definite people who are missing. Yes. We've, we're missing the Earth 2 Superman, Earth 2 Hawkman, Earth 2 Atom, Earth 2 Batman. Yeah, the Spectre's dead at this point. Yeah, so obviously it he would have been a big thing, yeah. yeah but That's another throwback to Justice League issue 83. We're missing those characters, but Dr. Fate does have a line, I can't remember whereabouts it is, where he said they've tried a couple of times to stop this Iron Hand doing what it's doing and you know, holding the Earth and being held to ransom, and basically I think that the first couple of times, maybe these yeah. guys have been knocked out of action. It's the top of page 8. Twice have we tried to release that evil mm-hmm. hand's grip upon our world, and twice have we failed. We're in so need of help, my friends, which is why we turn to you. So, I mean, it's possible. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, it could have been that the others have been displaced. It's kind mm-hmm. of weird that we don't see them come back. Yeah, that's that true. that's the case, that's we're true. reading between the lines, but, you mm-hmm. know, the fact that they went to another earth and got Superman, Hawkman, and the Atom. Yeah. You know, given that they, and Batman, obviously, given yeah. they're all they're all missing. Uh-huh. One thing that's fascinating is just the the volume of cast involved. Mm-hmm. Now, is this the best point? I think it probably is. Len Wein wrote this story, and I'm going to read now from the introduction to Crisis and Multiple Earths, Volume 3, the original trade paperback of that, which is published in 2004. Ooh. Len addresses the scale of this story in his introduction, so I'll read from it now. There I was, standing in Julie's office, Julie Schwartz, of course, being offered one of the brightest jewels in DC's crown. Of course I'll do this, he's referring to writing the Justice League, obviously. I'd love to do this. Are you sure I can do this? I asked Julie. Guess we'll both find out the hard way, he replied. Very reassuring, that man. One one more thing, Julie added. Your first issue? It'll be issue 100. It's the first part of the 10th annual JLA JSA crossover. <laughs> you might want to think about doing something special. <laughs> Dear God, did I think. That's Len continuing. The last few team-ups written by the venerable Denny O'Neill and young upstart Mike Friedrich had veered some from the original recipe created by the legendary Gardner Fox. As a reader, I'd always loved the mixing and matching of the greatest heroes of two worlds, breaking them up into individual chapters. First and foremost, I wanted to get back to that formula. Still, a story big enough to celebrate this comic's milestone needed to be something more. And that's when I remembered The Seven Soldiers of Victory. I don't recall at this late date exactly what I'd first read about the Lost Legionnaires as the Seven Soldiers were sometimes called, though I imagine it was probably Roy Thomas's seminal fanzine Alter Ego. I did remember that the Seven Soldiers had only appeared together twice, both times in the pages of DC's now long defunct leading comics. There they were, a third super team already owned by DC, just waiting for someone to give them their due. I called Julie and pitched the idea to him. You do realise you're crazy, don't you? He asked. That's an awful lot of characters to cram into a two-part story. Then why don't we make it a three-part story, I suggested. 
Julie didn't have to think about it for long. Sure. Why don't we? It's his reply. Len continues, so there I was, now faced with having to come up with a story that incorporated the entire membership of the JLA, as many members as possible of the Justice Society, open brackets, I omitted a few for simplicity's sake, and all the eight members of the Seven Soldiers. And if you read the story, you'll understand his numbering there. I even included all of the JLA's auxiliary members, like Metamorpho, Satana, and my old pal, the Elongated Man. Every Justice Leaguer made an appearance, even if it was only a cameo. The book was exquisitely illustrated by the vastly underrated and still terribly missed Dick Dillon, who never met a challenge he couldn't rise to, and inked by genial Georgiella and, at my insistence, the incomparable Dick Giordano. 33 Heroes. 33. The greatest gathering of superheroes ever recorded, the cover of JLA 100 exclaimed proudly. Who was I to say otherwise? I must have been out of my mind. So yeah, a cast of dozens. And it was weird because I think we might have said this before, but Mm -hmm. Peter and I had been thinking about doing the same thing as far as getting other people in to do the voices. Yes. Uh Because we always have a conversation every couple of months when we map out our next 10 or 12 episodes that we have to record. And we'd done our Hogmanay episode. The Lord of Bat Manor. Yeah. And for that one, you know, we'd got a couple of our pals and stuff in, Mm -hmm. and Max and Rich, Kenny and Tom from the the other podcast I worked on. They kind of played some of the smaller parts and we'd quite enjoyed how that sort of turned out. Yeah. Uh And in one of our Logopolis moments, Pete and I hadn't actually seen each other for a few days and then we just sort of said, like, you know, I'd been having an idea about JLA 100 to 102 and and then I sort of said, yeah, I've been sort of having... And then we started planning it and as I say, we recorded Arian's dialogue in February, Johnny did his Robin dialogue in March Yep. and it's taken us this long. (laughs) So it shows you how long, how far ahead we were working. Yep, and I literally got the last piece of dialogue in two days ago. No, yesterday, yesterday. Crikey. We're not going to say who, we're going to say who that was. (laughs) But we know you're listening. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've an absolute cast of thousands, and we probably won't attempt anything quite as ambitious again. Probably, well, who knows? We'll see what happens. He says, "Yeah, yeah. but um, we're, we're having ideas already." <laughs> anyway, I love the final panel of page fifteen, where they're all sort of divvied up into their groups because mm-hmm. he talks about deploy your fellows carefully. He's obviously he wants the the, the power split to be quite level yeah but when you look at them it's a little uneven Mm -hmm. superman and metamorpho two of the most powerful heroes there with wesley dodge who's got his gas gun yeah green lantern's probably the most powerful out of aquaman and wildcat and it's very funny that we'll talk about this when we get to to 102 it's hilarious that they have to have a flash flood to get Aquaman. yes chance to do some swimming (laughs) red tornado zatanna and flash is a very powerful team Uh dr fate the atom and elongated man it's kind of weighted towards kent but you know that's that's Uh still quite good Wonder Woman, Hawkman, and Doctor Midnight, that's a bit Earth level, as is well, Batman, Starman, and Our Man. I mean, Rex's enhanced strength, Ted's mm-hmm. cosmic rod, but if you forget about the Thunderbolt, then mm-hmm. Johnny, Green Arrow, and Black Canary, that's quite a. Yeah, it's low key. Yeah. 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 It's, it's quite interesting. I mean, you know, you were saying a, a minute ago about the flirtation between Flash and mm-hmm. Zatanna. I wonder if that influenced wow. that team up. The lads, you know, the three men, Batman, Starman, and Our Man, teaming up makes sense, but I think the most random one has to be Superman. Metamorpho and Sandman. <laughs> yeah. That was almost like, who's left? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much I can see that. But it's, it is interesting how they use Sandman in that. Well, we'll, we'll wait till we get to that chapter yes. and we'll talk about it. Yes. Uh-huh. But of course, that means that Diana Prince volunteers to stay behind, even although Batman says, come along with us, Diana. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's that, um, some, yeah, we'll get one of the girls to wait behind and yeah. keep an eye on things. Fortunately, the plot does advance in the next issue and it is good that she stayed behind yeah yeah she's involved so, yeah mm-hmm. as i think i said in the the actual our episode for jla 100 mm-hmm. oracle recounts the the plot of leading comics number one mm-hmm. to everyone which is fun and has actually sent me off to read through the seven soldiers archives actually i think for the first time since i ever bought them <laughs> which is terrible but did actually sort of make me realize that the plot of leading comics issue 14 mm-hmm. published september 1943 is actually very similar to this story or that we should say this whole story is very similar to that because that yeah that story has the seven soldiers being scattered through time to various mm-hmm. sort of points, like um, oh. Green Arrow and Speedy meet the Three Musketeers and Star Spangled and Stripes. They, they discover America, which is As nice. You do. Uh-huh. And Sir Justin gets to meet Leonardo da Vinci. Wow. Which is great. So if you've got the seven soldiers archives, listeners, go and read issue 14. It's cracking. If you enjoyed this, this whole epic and you want some more, that'll mm. give you a bit more of it. 
a lot of fun. It's funny that Len Wein said in his intro as well that they appeared twice in the Golden Age, and it's like, uh, no, they appeared a lot more often than that. Yeah, I think they seem, he's, they he's, he maybe had two appearances that he'd remembered. Yeah, I'm read. not sure what he remembered that at all. Or he was given two appearances as reference, perhaps. Is it the case that in all the stories there's only two occasions when they all meet up together? I don't mm, th- that can't no, be the case. Surely, so. They do seem to be, from yeah. flicking through them, they do seem to be quite integrated. Unless he means there's two that involve time travel, because there's one earlier on yeah. that involves time travel as well. That's a possibility. It's possible. Yeah. Hmm. So yes, the last chunk of issue 100 is taken up with Dr. Fate and the Atom rescuing the Crimson Avenger from ancient Mexico. Or maybe not ancient Mexico, but anyway, Mexico. The most interesting thing about that that I found that I didn't, again, I didn't pick up when we recorded it because I wasn't doing the dialogue for the Crimson. That it's a chunk of the Nebula Man that gives him these powers. Yes, that's fascinating. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I was surprised that that was the only time that really it became a factor. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the corrupting force in it as well. Mm-hmm. It's strange glowing rock that mm-hmm. it's that all of the Nebula Man reduced. There's an irony given who died that it was the Crimson that was then affected in this sort of way. Is mm-hmm. that an irony? It's not that much of an irony, but it's interesting. It'd been fascinating to think if a chunk of the Nebula Man had maybe been revealed to be being used by Cersei later on, yeah, uh-huh. or maybe influencing the the Native American Medicine Man or something. Mm-hmm. But I just wonder if it's maybe just something that Lane forgot about because he was having to write. <laughs> well, yeah, you see, it's fitting an awful lot in. Yeah, these days this would not be three issues. This would be at least a twelve issue maxi series. Oh, it would be Can you absolutely. Imagine? Yeah, and each little chunk would be a full issue's worth. Yeah, decompressed mm-hmm. to heck. Maybe rotating yeah. guest cast of of artists. You know, you can imagine maybe Kevin McGuire drawing the Canadian Green Arrow and Johnny Thunder one just for yeah. the sake of the expressions and the yeah, interpersonal stuff phenomenal. going on. Yeah. Who else? Someone like, I don't know, P.K. Russell or even Guy Davis drawing the Golden Age Sandman <gasps> chapter. Wow. Can you imagine Guy wow. Davis drawing Metamorpho and Superman? I can. It'd be amazing. They'd get Tony Harris back to draw the Starman chapter. I was chapter. thinking that very thing, yes. Monopolis. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that we've said this, it's, I can ima- and I've said this, I've made this sort of joke in the past. I can imagine Tom King just going, right, what am I going to do next? <laughs> I'm going to retell JLA 100 to 102 with a guest cast of rotating. I mean, he's kind of pretty much doing that yeah. in Danger Street anyway, isn't he? Get Jerry Ordway to do this, all the framing sequences. <sighs> yeah. Oh, suit mm-hmm. you, sir. Mm-hmm. I'd mm-hmm. buy it. Would you buy it, listeners? Write in and let us know. I'd buy two copies. One to keep in the bag. Yeah, I'd be getting Peter and Clive to <laughs> at least put one of each of the variants by so I could have a look at them. Mm. Yeah, the, the Iron Hand is introduced in the final page of part one. What's interesting is he shows his injury from before, his uh, destroyed his hand he's now got a replacement mechanical iron hand but see if you look a couple of pages before to the flashback where he gets injured it's, yes. a, it's a piece of machinery that falls on his back yes. that the vigilante shoots down yes. and both his hands are free yes <laughs> all I can so imagine what? all I can imagine is it was some kind of nerve damage mm. or something mm. Mm. I mean because we don't really they don't show us what happened yeah. ended the hand's criminal career seemingly forever so did they just leave him did he think he was dead underneath it and just walk away from it and didn't they tidy up after themselves? I don't well, know. don't know. The final panel of page 24 of issue 100. The other hand, to me, looks very much like the actor Jonathan Price. He does, yes. So that's who I was kind of trying to do the voice. With a with a David Niven moustache, almost. Yeah, yeah, I was going to try to think of when he was the, you know, when he was the master and mm-hmm. for Comic Relief's Doctor Who thing. And also that oh, time, yeah, that works. one of those occasions he was on Whose Line Is It Anyway and was very, very funny. <laughs> They're on YouTube, listeners. If you want to look them up and give yourself a laugh, tell them I sent you. So that being the end of issue 100, we're going to now talk about the, the contemporary correspondence that dealt with it. So, skipping ahead to the JLA mail room from issue 103, the first letter says, Dear Editor, JLA 100 is the best comics issue. <laughs> Haven't had that in a while. Take I, a drink. <laughs> I've seen, and I don't know how long. If the conclusion is anywhere near as good as the first part, this is going to have to be ranked with the classics of all time. First, the artwork. The cover is a vast improvement over what we've been getting recently. Evidently, artist Nick Cardi is much better at profiles than he is at full faces. I also liked the simplicity of the design. As for the inside, this is the best Dylan and Giella have ever done. But the scripting, the scripting, the tapestries, the tapestries, is what made this issue. I hadn't read too much by Len Wein, but he has now convinced me that he's the best thing to hit DC since Gardner Fox. Praise indeed. I loved Len Wein. Honestly, yeah. I was gutted when he died, man. Yeah. Just he just a guy that just knew comics. Simple as that. Yep. The writer continues. Thank you, thank you for finally discovering what the JLA is all about. An Earth's shattering menace, a mysterious clue, the small team ups. These are all the elements that make this magazine great. To comment on some selected sections, the introduction was handed superbly. 
Ween gathered his heroes together quickly, explained briefly, but adequately, why certain heroes were absent, and then let things get rolling. As a newcomer to the JLA, Ween showed an amazing amount of insight into his characters. The subtle antagonism between Hawkman and Green Arrow, Metamorpho's caustic remarks, or Fate's humility, and the elongated man's style of humour were all portrayed exceptionally well. Thank you, gentlemen. You have reaffirmed my faith in... Comics. <laughs> comics are the next, of course. The bane of our life. Yes. I'm beginning to think that maybe they are as good as they used to be. And that's from Perry Bielder from Oak Park, Michigan. Editorial response. And how long has it been since we've done a letters page? It feels like yonks. It does, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Editorial response. Just as the annual Justice League Justice Society stories manage to bring out the very best in us, so do they inspire our readers to reach the tops in letters of comment. JS. Right. Next letter. Dear editor. I didn't think that so many heroes could fit into 24 pages and yet maintain their identities, speak meaningful dialogue, take part in a well-conceived storyline, be funny, open brackets, Rav Dibney, the Badnesian T-Boat, close brackets, get annoyed, open brackets, Hawkman and Green Arrow again, yes, (laughs) Peter's dream dream night out, Chuck, if you're listening, (laughs) and above all, follow faithfully a fire department ordinance that occupancy in one comics magazine panel by more than 12 people is dangerous to the anchor's health. <laughs> the DC staff here involved pulled traditional sore thumbs into a smooth fitting groove. Number 100's The Unknown Soldier of Victory. I commend the choice of JLA and JC heroes, in particular the unique team-ups on page 15. The connection with the hand and the iron hand, which the readers, but not the heroes, realise. The use of the oracle, as believable as anyone beyond the mists of time and space can be, the Avatar of the Seven Soldiers of Victory, and a section in which Dr. Fate, the Atom, the Elongated Man seek and find the Crimson Avenger. In addition, with the inclusion of EM's nose twitching, Snapper Carr, John Johns and Adam Strange, it seems that Len Wein forgot no ingredient for this anniversary issue. A very positive letter from David Dash, I'm pronouncing that, Brooklyn, New York. No editorial response for that one, but the next letter says, Dear Editor, quite frankly, as the Justice League approached its 100th issue, I was afraid that we would be disappointed by a mediocre plot. What, I asked, could top the annual JLA JSA treat? Little did I dream that Len Bean could involve 33 superheroes <laughs> in his debut as a JLA writer, and that among these stars should be the legendary Seven Soldiers of Victory. Almost needless to say, writer Ween executed a flawless, well-developed, intriguing suspense story as a yarn in itself and as a setup for the concluding chapters. Artist Dylan and Giella are also to be commended in handling an especially difficult assignment involving so many superluminaries. And now as I sign off, I await with bated breath the next issue, which is certain to be Shazam material. And that prediction is from Joe Arrow from Fort Lee, New Jersey. Yeah, that's a reference to the Shazam Awards, obviously, because at this point, the original Captain Marvel wasn't in publication. Mm -hmm. But, as the crow flies, he's not that far away. That's true. He will be with us before you can say Jack Robinson. Another very positive letter. And I I liked what he said. It's the balance of part one. I mean, a huge part of it is exposition from Oracle. Yeah. Uh But it's still, it's very readable. It doesn't Mm -hmm. feel like you're just being lectured. That's true. Final letter then from issue 103. Dear Editor. Although I was terribly disappointed in that Sean Johns and Adam Strange had only cameo roles, The Unknown Soldier of Victory was one of the JLA's best ever. The basic plot was great. Then we finally noticed something that previous JLA scriptors overlooked. The menace doesn't have to threaten both us to prompt a Mm team-up. That's a good point. Dr. Fate's reason for summoning the JLA was entirely plausible. The little touches, which appear to be Mr. Ween's speciality and are sorely needed by the Justice League, were what made the story. Holding the anniversary celebration in the old secret sanctuary, the reason for John John's absence, the unknown soldier of victory monument, and the Crimson Avenger becoming the Aztec sun god, naturally because of his distinctive chest emblem, are all examples of these touches. The art, at last! Dylan and Giella seem to be finally getting away from their large, muscular neck syndrome. (laughs) They seem to have realised that not every hero needs a neck the size of a redwood trunk. In closing, thank you for the first 100, and get moving in your second, and that's from Bruce Jones, Man, what's that? Mancata, Minnesota. Minnesota. Yep. I wonder if that's a future writer, comic writer, Bruce Jones. We've had letters from Bruce Jones before. Mm, I think we've. Uh, yeah. Wondered that. Well, I think we Maybe have. Well, yeah, huh? I'm Robert George. Uh yes. JLA 100, a classic anniversary issue, the tenth meeting of the JLA and the JSA at a seminal moment in my personal comic book collecting history. Let's go back actually to January 1971. 
I'd already been reading a fair bit of comics at the time, but in January of 71, my mom and I moved from the UK to the States, to New York in particular. And at that wonderful time in history, you couldn't go to a convenience store in the city, certainly not in the borough of Manhattan, without seeing uh, some spinner rack of comics. And my comic book obsession truly took off. Perhaps a little bit too much, at least according to my mother at the time, because uh, several months later, she thought I was reading way too many comics and decided to grab my then burgeoning collection and throw them all down the garbage chute. Shall we say a slightly traumatic moment in my comic book <laughs> collecting experience. However, it may very well have been out of some kind of guilt that a few weeks later, when I found out that DC Comics was offering a subscription service for comics and they could be actually delivered to my own mailbox, I asked Mom if we could do that. And she agreed, again, perhaps out of guilt. My selections at the time were Batman, Justice League, and I believe World's Finest. And come summer 1972, what's the first book that comes into my mailbox? Yes, JLA number 100. What a fantastic, amazing cover. Obviously, I was too young to know the influence and importance of Nick Cardi in terms of designing and drawing so many DC covers at the time, but all I could tell was this was a remarkable cover. All of these heroes on it, heroes on opposite sides of, of a grave that said unknown soldier of victory, and then these ghost-like figures, the seven soldiers of victory, who at that point I had no idea who they were. Then when you open up the book, the scenario is kind of repeated, this time by longtime artist of the Justice League, Dick Dillon. And the last page ends in a cliffhanger, of course, where we see the villain of the piece, this, this man, the Iron Hand, threatening to crush the Earth. And it turned out to be something of a, shall we say, a cliffhanger for me, even more so, because as luck would have it, my family decided to move uh, in summer of 1972 uh, from New York to Connecticut. And as a result, I ended up missing issue 101. Apparently, the U.S. Postal Service was not as reliable as we were led to believe. So I ended up having to wait another full month to, to get issue 102, because this was a, a rare three-parter in uh, the JLA JSA series. So I ended up getting the conclusion, but there was a whole missing issue with three chapters in it of uh, the JLA JSA tracking down members of the Seven Soldiers of Victory. I think it took me several months before I actually uh, had a chance to finally read JLA 101. Number 100 is amazing in and of itself. The entire three-parter is fantastic. And it's, uh, it's all the more remarkable when you realize that this was Len Wein's first time writing the JLA. And he you know, came in with a, a, th a three-parter that is, uh, I would say, in the top three or four of all of the JLA, JSA crossovers in history. And again, my first comic that I actually subscribed to and one that is still memorable, dare I say it, 50 years later. So, moving on then mm -hmm. to issue 101. Yes. My favourite cover of the three, actually. Why would this be your favourite cover, David? Please tell us. Because it's got all the heroes up and down both sides and one of them's Our Man and I love Our Man. <laughs> and, you know, let's be honest, it's like, is it the only time that Our Man and Metamorpho appeared in a sidebar in the oh, same comic. Be. Yes, uh -huh. Throw in Sandman, Doctor Midnight and Diana Prince, you know, the non powered Wonder Woman at that point. It's it's very interesting. I thought you were referring to the main cover image, which is the scene of the giant hand in space, giant iron hand in space. Yes. Grasping at all the heroes. Which doesn't actually appear at any point in the story. Apart yeah. from in the splash page as well. Which yeah. is uh, But know. even in the splash page it's the taloned hand, it's not the iron hand. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I mean it's I it suppose it's it's symbolic, isn't it? It is. It's, it's metaphorical. It's a nice bit of symbolism going on. And as I've you've probably seen by now, I found a couple of different foreign reprint versions of that one, which mm. I've flung onto the socials by now. Hopefully by now, listeners, you'll have seen the three different Spanish covers for the three episodes, and all of which had new artwork. 
based mm-hmm. on segments from the story and didn't just reprint the American ones. So they're they're fascinating. If you haven't seen them already, get the to Instagram and check out the, the Earth 2 podcast. So Diana Prince Wonder Woman sitting clock watching. Three new arrivals. Yes. We've got Alan Scott Green Lantern. We have the Earth 2 grown up, Dick Grayson, Robin, and Mr. Terrific. Yep. I was delighted to get my work colleague Jonathan Horner involved as Robin. Because Johnny talks like that normally. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny's great. Johnny's a sweetheart, and I thought it'd be, you know, we'd do, I think, I'd, very feel when we'd done the adult Robin before, we'd given him a bit of an Adam West sort mm-hmm. of yeah. timber. Touch, yeah. So I thought Johnny would be the, the best man for it, and Brandon Peters was happy at the 11th hour to leap in and be the Golden Age Green Lantern for us as well, which is yes. good, because it gave him a bit more to do, because originally he was just going to be Snapper Car and mm-hmm. Star Spangle Kids, so lots of fun. I like the recap, especially the panel on page three, when it's almost Diana's point of view of everyone disappearing. Yeah. I like uh-huh. that. It's, uh-huh. you know, it's different to what we got in the previous chapter, but it really sells it from our, our POV. I like it a lot. And then we've also got the reveal that the Seven Soldiers of Victory are completely forgotten. They don't remember them at all. We've had that in the first issue as well, yeah. but it's it's just reiterating that in the second yeah. issue. Almost yeah. as if they've been taken fully out of time and yeah. their timeline's almost wiped. Yeah, that is a fascinating thing. Mm. They didn't really... Dwell in that in the first part. Yeah, they didn't yeah. really dwell on it being resolved in as much mm-hmm. as them being brought back and did that automatically return onto everyone's memory. Snap back like a rubber band. Yeah, yep. does, does that mean that the entire world had forgotten about them because because of the nature of mm-hmm. what the Nebula Man in the hand were doing? Was it mm-hmm. changing reality? <gasps> Gosh, so many questions. Well, as we know, later on, we the All-Star Squadron where all these heroes knew each other, but at this point, there were very few times that they met. But Earth 2 Robin has met the Star Spangled Kid and Stripesy in the pages of World's Finest Number 9. Pete's got a copy of World's Finest Number 9. <laughs> this is the second time, I think, in as many weeks, I think we've mentioned that. Let's just He's just going to rub that in again, listeners. I might mention it again <laughs> later on. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so they do know each other, so he should know them. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a fair point. And of course, the All-Star Squadron is, a, is one of the biggest retcons of all time. But you know, yep. they were all mm-hmm. members of, of that one team. Mm-hmm. So the first sort of proper little story chapter of issue 101 features that random team of Superman, <laughs> Wesley Dodds and Metamorpho. Yes. Um, with a cameo by my old mate Mick Pride as Genghis Khan. Now we need to talk about Genghis Khan. Yes. We did allude to this in a recent episode where we discussed a flash story featuring Vandal Savage. Yes. And in it, it was revealed that Vandal Savage, who is an Earth 2 character in the past, was actually Genghis Khan. Yes. Because he's immortal, you see, and he's yes. been various people through yes. history. And that story was written by Len Wein. This story, <laughs> written, this story also see, written by Len Wein. Can you see where Peter's going here, listeners? Features Genghis Khan, who is a more traditional Genghis Khan and not vandally or savagey in the in slightest. Yeah, it's difficult to <laughs> to reconcile it, isn't it? Because he's dro- he's not drawn looking remotely like Vandal, unless no. Vandal was wearing makeup or something. I don't know. Unless Vandal posed as Genghis Khan, perhaps. Maybe that's, that's that's a possibility. That's an idea. Maybe it assumed is maybe he did away with the original at some point and just took over and could have done. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. possible. That's a thought. Because it's not like you know they've got photos of him up anywhere, no, that's or true. you know you couldn't just Google what Genghis Khan looked like. <laughs> Listeners, if you want to know what Genghis Khan looked like, go and Google him just now and see what you think. Maybe maybe we'll find a, an an accurate image of him and do a tweet featuring him at some point. Yep, this is a fun chapter, I think. Mm. Superman at this point, in his own book, we're a little away from it happening at this point, he'd been, shall we say, significantly depowered. Yes, that's correct. Uh-huh. And it's fascinating that he was able to move an entire village As off do. panel to somewhere else where um, Genghis and that couldn't get to. Or did he move the whole mountain? <laughs> I don't know. That was quite vague. Mm-hmm. But I was quite amused at that. Quite tickled by the fact that, you know, Soup's doesn't seem he only seems to have this limited power whenever people remember that's true of course in this chapter as well it's the shining knight the yes. trying to rescue ably played by dan butcher of the awesome comics podcast now when i approached the guys at the awesome comics podcast all three of them appear in this by the way when i approached them i said that they can choose between vince and dan which characters they play between uh, the shining knight and the other one and dan chose the shining knight right and he nailed it it was fantastic I have to take Peter's word for it at this point, because <laughs> I haven't heard it. You will have heard it. Dan, thank you. It's thank you for giving on, voice to Sir Justin. gusto. It's, it's amazing. And at yeah. this point, I've not, I mean, I've known Mick. I've known Mick for nearly 30 years. Mm-hmm. Mick gave me one of my two most prized possessions in the whole world. Gosh. Which is his Take That Crew t shirt from when he worked for them at the, the exhibition centre in, in Glasgow in 1994. It's to my wow. left right now. Wow. I can put my hand on it. It's never far away. Hold it up for the benefit of the YouTube yes, viewers. Yes, I'll hold it yes. up for the benefit of our YouTube viewers. There we go. 
There we are. See, so get that. Look at that. Crikey. Great, Local crew. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the logo's on it's actually slightly smaller than my recent tattoo, which is quite funny. So I was delighted. And Mick's obviously supported the podcast since we started, so it was lovely to actually be able to give him a part. So cheers, matey. Much appreciated. I just love the fact that Metamorpho as well just turns into a tank. <laughs> it's the most random of team-ups. Wesley mm. Dodds and Metamorpho. You know, it's like it's like the... The GMS 2000s, Brave and the Bold. Yeah. You know, let's pick two guys that, mm-hmm. you know, it's glorious. And I hope Shag doesn't mind me saying it, but his voice is perfect. Yep. Yep. For Metamorphal. Absolutely. It worked so well and they gave it gusto. So again, cheers, Shag. That's yes. amazing. And probably we're going to ask you back when we do that issue of Brave and the Bold with Plastic Man and, and Metamorpho. So that's your notice yeah. on that one, matey. We'll see. I did find it weird, Metamorpho turning into the tank because obviously. <laughs> When he's firing his shells, is he firing off bits of himself? Yes, there's a, there's a weird ejaculation metaphor, isn't there? Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Especially considering the top half of his body is like the, on top of the tank. Mm. And, um, let's well, not dwell on Wesley's this. Wesley's got a line though where he says, get those spare atoms of yours working. Well, I've got some spare atoms that can have some of mine around my midriff, that's fine. Maybe that's how he controls, I don't know. It's Maybe I mean, that's I, why he was so excited by the birthday cake, he can get some more yeah, atoms into them. Yeah. I haven't read enough Metamorpho to, to comment on it. One thing we should point out as well is how nice to have the Sandman's little calling card at the end of that chapter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was nice. And also the rescue Winged Victory as well, which is yes, important. Yes, can't forget that Winged Victory is yes. there. He doesn't have any lines. We didn't um, no. have any animals to, to play his part. No animals are harmed in the making of this podcast. Yes. So Green Lantern's getting a bit fidgety mm-hmm. in the next page, and him and Robin and Mr. Terrific fly off to, to the Himalayas. As we see some of the actual effects of this giant hand. Yeah. On the world. There's an, there's an interesting bit when it cuts back to their hand later, later on, and he's watching them sort of rescue these kids in the Himalayas. And it all suggests to me that it was all going on simultaneously. Yeah. Uh-huh. That, you know, mm-hmm. while each hero team was landing in its time zone and dealing with what's going on, the others were all doing the thing at the same time. It's, yeah. I'd love to see an, a full, proper, full blooded animated adaptation. Maybe someone will animate our, to our soundtrack. <laughs> um, wouldn't that be fun? I mean, this is. I think this is, at this point, this is definitely my favourite JLA-JSA team-up. So yes, chapter two of this one, guest starring my, my old mate Kenny Smith as Dr. Midnight, as we said earlier on, Dr. Mm-hmm. Midnight with that slight East Coast timber. And they're back in the time of Robin Hood. Yes. In Nottingham. No sign of the sheriff, but we do see Little John, ably played by another one of the awesome comics podcasters, Vince Hunt. And you, you haven't heard that either yet. I haven't heard no. it yet. <gasps> And again, Vince is amazing. And also this mission was to rescue the Earth to Green Arrow, who is very appropriately in Nottingham, you know, considering, you know, he's an archer and all that. Yeah. And of course, uh, he must have been there for quite some time because he's picked up the accents. <laughs> I remember the first time I read this story, sort of wondering if it was going to be revealed that Green Arrow had been Robin Hood all along. That's what I thought as well. And I hoped that was going to be the case. You yeah. know, he's been there for a while and that has been the thing. But no, and that's why uh, he put on the voice. But no. Tony Esmond, again from the Awesome Comics Podcast and the Never Iron Anything Podcast, ably provided us with that voice. I said to him, Tony, if you can do an American, that's cool. If you can't, that's fine. He says, I'll just use my own voice. <laughs> so thank you, Tony. Thank that's you for great. trying at least, Tony. <laughs> thank you for giving us the opportunity to make that joke. Because yes. that's fine. <laughs> no, I like that one. It's one of my, you know, there's almost a genre feel to each mm-hmm. chapter. I mean, you can I can imagine the Genghis Khan one as being some sort of like, almost like a Hammer movie, but this one feels yeah. very much like the, you know, the yeah, events of Robin Flinny. Hood. Sort yeah. Of, huh? yeah. Mm. One of the things that I like about it, I mean, it, obviously I mentioned Leading Comics 14 earlier on mm-hmm. and how that had a almost genre sort of approach to, yeah. to everything, but it's it's fun. I mean, it's good in this chapter, Hawkman gets to be strong and violent with an old piece of weaponry and yeah. Wonder Woman gets to use her lasso and mm-hmm. Doctor Midnight gets some fun action using his blackout bomb. That yep. was pretty cool. Do you know, actually, when I saw Kenny just on Sunday there, mm-hmm. I hadn't seen him for a while. He'd been on his holidays and had to give me his birthday present. Kenny hadn't picked up on the fact that Dr. Midnight was blind. <laughs> I don't know if I hadn't told him or if he hadn't picked that up from, even uh-huh. though, like, you know, he has, he does have a, a thought bubble where he says, my blind eyes can see this perfectly. <laughs> Kenny hadn't registered. Kenny, what you like? Pay attention, 007. <laughs> so um, it's a shame that Dr. Midnight didn't have any more lines later on because I quite frankly would have loved to have yeah. Kenny rock up again, but not to worry. <laughs> Another time. Another yes, time. indeed, indeed. Mm. I'm Tony Esmond. I don't think I ever saw this originally, um, although I was a fan of those crossovers. I hadn't seen this particular issue until I got the DC app, which I suppose is about a year or so ago. Saying that, I am a massive fan of Len Wein. I think he's great, great writer, exceptional editor, and absolutely great raconteur. He did a few podcasts, didn't he? I think he was on some kind of writer's podcast I used to listen to. Absolutely brilliant. I'm also a fan of Dick Dillon, actually. I, I, I have to say, I don't think he gets enough love. 
But, uh, mate, love love the Earth too. Big fan. Uh, always makes me laugh, especially when Pete does his ladies' voices. Yeah, I look forward to hearing this, mate. So the next segment is the Iron Hand sort of doing some interior decorating. Yes, as he destroys a big giant copy of the Daily Herald. Yep, watching the Seven Soldiers. Watching mm-hmm. Alan, Terry, and Robin on the on the screen on the on mm-hmm. flying trapeze, and then it's probably obviously because Iron Man's in it, Starman's in it. Probably is it in my favourite chapter of the whole saga? Probably, probably is. Let's mm-hmm. be honest. When I asked Steve to to do stripes, you up for doing stripes? Sure, he said, and um, I said, would you try and do it as Luke Wilson? <laughs> Steve naturally has that sort of gentle Midwest to his voice anyway, so sure. I think he was the perfect fit. Mm-hmm. And as we said at the top earlier on, obviously we had to ask Ross to play Starman for us. Yes, because of his amazing Opal City Confidential podcast that he does as part of Stop Let's Team Up, which right. you should all be listening to. You really should. You really should, because if I didn't say it already, Ross is covering all the Starmen. He's doing deep dives on the James Robinson series. He's doing deep dives on the original run in adventure comics, but mm-hmm. he's also covering Prince Gavin, he's covering Michael Thomas, yep. he's covering Will Payton. He's covered the star men of the Silver Age that we covered. Yes. Batman and, of course, the star hyphen man. Yeah, we helped we helped out with those. I'm appearing a bit more regularly sort of on the, the Times Past episodes of the Jack Knight series, but it's, it's great. I mean, it's I think anyone had realised just quite how much star man there was to cover. Yes. So uh-huh. good luck with it, Ross. <laughs> Keep it going. <laughs> we have You have our full support. And I will be back on it at some point, Ross. I've only been on once so far, but yes. uh, now that now that Pete's finished editing, <laughs> JLA one hundred to one hundred and two, we might have a little I'm bit more time. I'm not finished yet. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing we should, we have to talk about about this chapter. I mean, it's great. I mean, yeah. Starman's connection to the cosmic rod is emphasised. Our man gets to fling some people about. Stripes he gets big and strong. But this story, this chapter was was retold in issue nine of Jeff Johns' series, Stars and Stripe, published in February 2000. Mm -hmm. Because basically in that story, Pat is telling Courtney and his family the history of the Seven Soldiers of Victory. And at this point, this post-crisis period, obviously, nothing really had been done with the Seven Soldiers. Sure. Uh They'd been in All-Star Squadron, they'd been in Young All-Stars, but obviously Green Arrow and Speedy had been removed from the continuity. Mm -hmm. So they weren't, you know, there was a lot of vagueness about what their lineup was, given given that there wasn't a a Green Arrow or a Speedy anymore. Uh And the way that Jeff John sort of tackles this in Stars and Stripe is that he has Speedy, in essence, sort of replaced by Stuff, Vigilante's sidekick. Uh But Green Arrow is replaced. And this this was a lovely bit of synergy. I remember at the time just loving it. I wish mm. I'd known Peter at the time, actually, so we could have both jumped up and down and screamed at how cool it was. <laughs> he replaced the arrow-wielding Oliver Queen with the spider. Yes. Another archery-influenced superhero. Now, mm-hmm. what it also did was it built on some stuff that James Robinson had done with the spider in the mm-hmm. pages of the Shade miniseries yeah. and what he would do in Starman, which was that basically the spider was really a baddie pretending to be a hero. Sure. So what ends up happening in this issue of Stars and Stripe is that the spider, on the surface, a member of the, the Seven Soldiers and who's mm-hmm. given them the details to build the weapon that will destroy the Nebula Man, is actually working with the hand and has deliberately sabotaged ah. it and sent him off with malfunctioning equipment. Interesting. But then Billy Gunn, who's a friend of the Vigilante, leaps mm-hmm. in, tells Wing about it, because mm-hmm. Wing's still there. Wing gets the missing bit of the gun, takes it to the others, there's the whole big thing, when sure. they all get scattered through time. Uh-huh. And it, it plays out with, again, Stripesy being rescued by Batman, Starman and Our Man. It's interesting because oh, Stripesy doesn't know who Batman is. He, he knows interesting. that. Interesting. And he, say, he says something like, and some, guy I didn't, some grumpy guy that I didn't recognise. Mm-hmm. But one thing that's really different in it, and this, again, tied into what was bubbling under in the continuity at the time. Mm-hmm. I think we're still about a year away from Hawkman coming back in the pages of JSA. But instead of Ted summoning his cosmic rod by telepathy, yeah. like he does in JLA 101, they are sort of set free from the pyramid prison by a very young Prince Khufu. Oh, who grows up to be... Yes, and get reincarnated as Hawkman. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was Jeff adding another little Roy Thomas-style mm-hmm. retcon yep, nice. to it. Mm-hmm. And basically, there's the moment at the end where they get everyone back to the present day and... One of the things that's sort of interesting is that the Sandman, Wesley Dodds, is drawn mm-hmm. in that post-Vertigo <gasps> style with the, the, the trench coat the, and the, the, long, the longer mask moves, rather yeah, than uh-huh. his evening cape and the short and the, squat the mask. One, yeah. And mind me all the different masks for YouTube viewers. Of course. And there's also a bit where they sort of say that because Johnny Thunder had, had mucked up, and there's a great, you see Green Arrow sort of slapping him in the back of the head, they were 20 years too late getting Greg Sanders. So Greg Sanders had been in the Old West for 20 years. Ah, um, yeah. So he was an, he was older when by the time they rescued him. And that ties into James Robinson's miniseries. Yep, 
and all this organic, really, really respectful yeah. JLAJSA stuff that, mm-hmm. that James and, and Jeff were doing at the time. So mm. um, if you haven't read the Stars and Stripes series, and you really should have done by now, folks, if you listen to this podcast, go and find a copy of issue nine. I've got a spare if you're struggling. <laughs> But it's joyous. I remember at the time just being so delighted by it. And it was fun to come back, you know, because there's little things. They mentioned that um, I think Stuff had spent time in ancient Greece. So right, it's okay. going to be the case that Stuff experienced mm-hmm. exactly what happened to the Speedy. The speedy. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, it's a fun story if you don't know it. Yeah. And it just adds on. Obviously, this week on the socials, I'll put up the cover and a few select panels from mm. it so you can have a look. The most interesting thing about it was the, the way they addressed the post crisis lineup yeah. of uh-huh. the team. And we'll come back to that. Definitely. Later on. A couple of points about this chapter that I really enjoyed was the fact that Stripesy did recognise Batman, even though he's, he's the Earth 1 Batman and he's got the yellow oval. As we've discussed in the podcast before, <laughs> Earth 2 Batman has at least once worn a yellow oval. Yes. Even if it was just for like a, a lineup photograph or painting, then yes, that is the case. And also, I'm amazed that Stripesy didn't try and build a time machine to try and get back home because he built a time machine in World's Finest Number 9. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, maybe, I don't know, man, maybe it was just what you had available at the time. Could be, could be. Mm. But there we go. I just thought I'd mention that. It's mm-hmm. a, so I could mention the fact I've got World's Finest Number 9 again. Listeners, <laughs> take a drink every time we mention the fact that Peter's got a shoe in World's <laughs> Finest. Hey, hi. Ross Aiken from Stop Let's Team Up, home of Starman, uh, Opal City Confidential. In my memory, Justice League 100 is the first one I read. We were moving cross-country. My dad was in the Marine Corps. He, uh, we'd spent a year at Camp Pendleton on, in California. Then we were driving to Pennsylvania so he could go to the Army War College. We did this real, like, National Lampoon's vacation kind of road trip. My older two brothers, my little sister, me, my mom, and dad. In 1972, we went across America. And we stopped at my grandfather's house to visit on our way. And it was really hot. I remember that. There was a waiting pool. I read this. I think it was Superboy 197 with the return of Timberwolf. But I remember this being the first one and and my brother making sure I got them. Because I was like, who are all these other characters? It was like, you know, it's not probably the best comic to give you, little brother. Without them having, you know, knowing who the characters were. But it was great because I like these. But maybe that's why I like Super Team books. My formulative comics are this, Avengers 105, uh, which I've done on my show, talked about on my show. And Superboy and Legion uh, 197, as I just said. So, yeah, this was like the first Justice League I ever read. And I, I vividly remember where I read it in my grandfather's front yard while I was sitting in a waiting pool. Chapter two winds up again back at headquarters with Diana Prince. Now, it's interesting. Listeners, if you have a copy of issue 11 of DC Special Blue Ribbon Digest, you might want to take a look at that page because, and I'll put this up on the socials as well so you can see it. Did I tell you about this, I think it is. I think I mentioned yeah, it to you mm-hmm. and I dug it out. The artwork for this final page is sort of extended and extrapolated and reformatted basically so that the two panels, instead of just taking up half a page at the top, fill up a full page in the Digest comic. Mm-hmm. So I'll post the cover of the Digest and some of the inside pages that were also recolored for this reprint. I'll post some of them on the socials this week so make sure you check those out. Mm-hmm. So we now come to the letters for this chapter. Certainly do. Jumping ahead to the GLA mail room from issue 104. And the first letter says, Dear Editor, GLA 101 is here and with it, the concluding instalment of the annual Justice League Justice Society team up. But no, this time you've thrown tradition to the winds and allowed it to run on for a third issue. Well, I'll let you get away with it this time, considering the special occasion. But in general, I think you should have less continued stories and recapture the lost art of the single-issue story. This goes for every comic today. Very much so. Yeah, sorry, that's an aside. Uh, Editorial aside from us there. (laughs) So so tired of the decompressed writing for the trades. Mm -hmm. No, Back to the letter. However, this anniversary story is a special occasion, and what a special occasion. Not content with the 29 heroes he'd already included, Len Wein introduced three more to this issue, including two of the most neglected members of the GSA. I hope he intends to give Diana Prince an active role in the story, instead of the passive one she seemed destined for last issue. Stay tuned. Mm. One suggestion, though. You should go back to the old, 1963-1967, to practice of an all-text splash page, summarising the previous instalments. It takes up less space and enables a person rereading the story all at once 
to skip the recap without breaking the continuity. But let me congratulate you again on what looks like, at least so far, the best JLA story yet. And when you consider it's only Len Wein's first shot at the strip, the mind boggles at the possibilities of what the man may produce in the future. And that's from Richard H. Morrissey from Framingham, Massachusetts. We've not heard from Richard for a while. Editorial response to that one then. Upon looking back at those old text splash summaries of years gone by, they struck us as being eyesores, as well as dizzifying condensations of the various storylines. Hence, we discarded the What Went On Before page in favour of gently filling in the reader, new and old, with only as much background material as needed for the current instalment. JS, that's interesting. I, mean, I remember as a neophyte Marvel collector in the, the mid-80s and getting issues with the Defenders whenever I could, mm-hmm. they regularly, almost every issue, had a little bit of recap, two or three panels yeah. that would... Mm-hmm. And I remember there's one one issue during the Headmen story around about issue 30-odd. Oh, crazy. Where there's about four pages worth uh-huh. recapping everything that's been going on before yeah, because uh-huh. so much had been going on before. Mm-hmm. I quite like the way they did it here. It's Diana bringing the others up to speed. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. As opposed to sitting there thinking, you know, yeah. it is, yeah. has a narrative yeah. function. Yeah, telling her and telling us what we already know. She mm-hmm. gets to tell Green Lantern and Robin and, and, and Terry like what they... It's, yeah. it's much yeah. better. Anyway, the second letter. Dear Editor... Jelly 101's The Hand That Shook the World was better than I thought it would be. I thought, actually, at the end of last issue's story, that patterns would be set before page one of the second part of the story, that is, this issue's story, which would make parts two and three so predictable and so uninteresting as to be almost not worth the effort to read. But I was wrong. Some patterns, of course, continued, but there were surprises. Then there was the introduction to this issue of the Earth 2 Green Lantern, Mr. Terrific and Robin, and there was the sudden appearance of the villain in the last scene about to attack Wonder Woman. All in all, part two proved to be very unpredictable, and part three promises to be even more so. One thing I noticed that, while last issue the traditional Wonder Woman was drawn sexier than she's usually been drawn, this issue she wasn't drawn that sexy. I actually don't know if this was good or bad. <laughs> and that's from Lester G. Oh my goodness, Boutillier? Mm-hmm. New Orleans Ailey. Now we have heard from him before, haven't we? Yeah, that's familiar. Uh-huh. I recognise that so. name. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm now going to go scurrying back to see what I think about how sexy Wonder Woman looked. <laughs> Editorial response to that one then. Yes, Julie Schwartz says, good or bad for whom, Lester? <laughs> hmm. right. Next letter says, dear editor, I knew it. I just knew you couldn't confine the 10th annual Justice League Justice Society team up to two issues. With all the subplots, it was a complete impossibility. But I'm not complaining because I've got a subscription. <laughs> the hand that shook the world was very good the caption narration was particularly superb excellent narration is most always an earmark of any Len Wein scripted saga but, ah yes, the inevitable but I shan't let this letter pass without a few complaints <gasps> my major complaint concerns the dialogue it simply is too corny at times or perhaps a better word would be camp I shudder as I type that word I type of such words as Wonder Woman's Moat Fording is my department. Dr. Midnight's Hawkman, keep on flying. Stripesy's Shut up, fatso. And our man's Naturally, we're the good guys. This is realism? If Metamorpho had said such things, I wouldn't object because that's part of his characterization. Plus, this silly dialogue makes the plot hard to follow and to understand. Nevertheless, I managed to read this story partly blocking the nutty dialogue, and enjoy it. And that's from James T. McCoy Jr. That's a Star Trek pseudonym if ever mm. heard one, from Valley Station, Kentucky. I have a feeling we've heard from him before as well. Uh, also, he should maybe stop reading comics before Roy Thomas takes over. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of, dis- you know, I think he's missing the point of the fact that it's the big exciting summer crossover. Yeah. Some of the, softening some of the character stuff like that might have mm-hmm. made it a bit, mm. a bit grim. I don't know. Yeah. Julie's response to that is, Len Wein prides himself on his dialogue, but we wonder, after reading your complaint, there goes the pride. Interesting. Final letter. Dear editor, Len Wein may not be the best writer in comics with an X, but he's certainly the most versatile. Is there a whole bunch of horror stories, adaptations of Korak and other Edgar Rice Burroughs creations, superhero stories that feature characterisation a la Denny O'Neill, and now a jelly masterpiece that I can only describe as a Gardner Fox story with good dialogue? Gosh. Gosh. Len is handling the JLA exactly as it should be. Emphasis on plot and action. No scenes wasted and just characterisation. Personalities come through in the dialogue only when the storyline is advanced at the same time. Interesting. And a nice Mm -hmm. rebuff, actually, to what the previous guy was saying. Indeed, yes. And that's from Paul M. Rath, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
And Julie Schwartz says, correction please, here comes the prize. Yes, there we go, readdressing the balance there. Hello, I'm Steve Higgins. You might know me from previous appearances on the podcast as the voice of Jimmy Olsen. But for the JLA 100 through 1027 Soldiers crossover, I voiced three different characters. I voiced the Crimson Avenger, I voiced Stripesy, and I voiced Johnny Thunder. With the Crimson Avenger, I tried to do a voice that was a pretty prototypical superhero voice, and I think I did pretty well with it. The only thing that gave me any difficulty at all was in pronouncing the name of the sun god, Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli. I don't know that I got that right even now, but I tried my best. Then with Stripesy, David asked me to try to do my best Luke Wilson. It's something he's actually commented on in the past to me that I have naturally a bit of an accent that sounds like Luke Wilson to his ear. So it wasn't too hard for me to put that voice on a little bit, just kind of slowed it down and exaggerated just a bit, trying to sound like Pat Duggan from the Stargirl TV series. Now, Courtney, don't you know? Uh, Again, I don't know how successful I was with that, but that was the attempt. And then with Johnny Thunder, I tried to do something that was a little bit like the Jimmy Olsen voice, but sounded different enough that he was unique. He was a different character. David had originally asked me to do it a bit like Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> and I, I just didn't see how that would work, really. And that, oh, that's a horrible Jimmy Stewart. I can do, I can do a little bit of Jimmy Stewart. Um, Zuzu's pedals. Merry Christmas, Bedford Falls. I can't do a great Jimmy Stewart. I can do a bad imitation of Jimmy Stewart. And I just didn't think that that would work for Johnny Thunder's character. So I tried to do something that was a bit more like Jimmy Olsen. And I think it worked out pretty well. I think the hardest part with Johnny Thunder's role was when he had the hiccups and I was having to deliver the dialogue and hiccup at the same time to try to make it sound natural and also not find myself out of breath. I had a great time recording all of this for this episode, these episodes of the podcast. I hope you all had a great time listening. It's a really phenomenal story. I was glad to be a part of it. It's pretty classic DC comics, if you ask me. And I've always loved the JLA JSA team ups, especially when you know, different groups of heroes would end up pairing off and going off on little side quests and side adventures and coming back. One of the first comics that I remember owning was Justice League of America 200, the anniversary issue and you know that story featured the characters all kind of splitting off and going off and doing their own little side quests and i've always 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 enjoyed the big crossovers with you know a cast of literally dozens of superhero characters would all split off and go and do their own little thing and then come back together at the end for a big adventure and that was probably my favorite part of this story and it you know it's became a trope somewhat of all the different JLA JSA crossovers and uh, it's a trope that I just absolutely love. So loved this, loved each of the heroes in various time periods and various locations around the globe. It was a ton of fun. Uh, so glad that they asked me to be a part of it and uh, hope you all enjoyed listening. That was fun. So we so come to issue 102, which if it had our man and Metamorpho amongst the, the people standing up at Looking up at Superman, maybe that would be my favourite cover of the three of them. I don't know. Yeah, the concluding part of this three-parter. Yeah, I like it. I like the fact that Batman is deep in thought and Wonder Woman's looking up at him and mm. questioning it and Flash is looking up and Wesley's there. It's Yeah. Yep. But it's the Earth 2 Wonder Woman looking at the Earth 1 Batman. So yep. it's, it's fascinating. You know, it's quite cool. So this is the point when I was making my notes that I was just struck that Oracle looked like Alan Moore. <laughs> <laughs> The, the fascinating throne that he's sitting on, where it's sort of carved out of like human figures holding up the mm-hmm. the bits, the, the, the sort of the arm wrestling. It's fascinating. I should like a chair like that. Yes, I tell you. I must say at this point that I've heard uh, said by Johnny Cannon, who does uh, his own comics, uh, The United, which is excellent. Just check it out. He once said that uh, Alan Moore is basically the love child of David Bellamy and Pam Ayers. <laughs> and ever since he said that, I can't get that image out of my head. Guapo make white nuts. So. <laughs> yes. Pam Ayers, listeners, if you don't know her, 
She, my mum used to be really quite irritated by her. Really? Because she, she, she was a lady, I think she was on either New Faces or one of these TV talent shows in British mm. TV in the 70s, and she won just by doing witty poems. Yeah. And the fact that she's, you know, you don't see so much of her or people like her is really just an indication of the decline of this country, quite frankly, if you ask me. Anyway, moving on. Chapter one of 102 was probably the one that Peter had to do the most work on. In the editing, isn't that right? Yes, this was great because the only voice that actually is in it that is ours is me doing the the medicine man. Mm. Everything else was a guest voice and it was fantastic. Again, it was Chuck Lauridens. Hi, Chuck. He did an amazing Green Arrow. The wonderful Kelly Blair as Black Canary. And we had our friend Steve Higgins as Johnny Thunder. Yeah, Kel's unfortunately in inheriting that sort of established Black Canary tradition that <laughs> when Vince did Canary for us in Brave and the Bold years ago now, of making making her a bit of a southern belle, yeah. which we've kind of just gone with for continuity. So It kind of distinguishes her from her other female characters yeah. anyway. So, so, so Kel's had to do her best attempt at being a southern belle. I've not heard it yet, Kelly. I don't know how well you did. <laughs> I'm sure you did fine. <laughs> but yeah, Johnny, Steve doing Johnny was another last minute sort of mm-hmm. Thing you know, because we we drew up a sort of potential cast list and asked people to do stuff, and people but we kind of went on and we're like, right, we're still doing it. We want to do this. Should we ask Steve to do jo- Steve? Might want to do Johnny Thunder, so yep. we had to ask him to do that. And of course, we we got Ranger Gord to play Vigilante, of course, which is listeners, amazing. Listeners, if you have never heard Prairie Justice, the Vigilante podcast, you have to listen to it as soon as possible. It's it's, it's kind of fantastic. Getting Gord to play Greg, it's kind of the equivalent of when they got John Wesley Shippen to play Jay Garrick on the Flash TV yes, show. Yes, that's the perfect analogy, yes. Who else would you get? You know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of, like, I'm trying to think of... <laughs> it's like get- getting Michael Keaton to play Batman in a Flash movie. <laughs> it, yeah, kind of, yeah, it kind of is, yeah. I'm trying to think of, is there any, any time in Doctor Who when, mm. where they've done anything like that? But Doctor Who is really quite good most of the time at getting actors who've played the same part to come back. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a privilege, sir. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for, for thank you for joining us. Indeed. Yeah, thank you for taking part. Absolutely. Prairie Justice, as I said, is a fantastic show. Ranger Gord does pretty much radio style adaptations of some of the stories, more so than we do. Mm. And he's covering lots of vigilante material from the Golden Age, as well as the other Seven Soldier stories. So yeah, check them out because it's fantastic. Howdy, Peter and David. Thanks for including me here on uh, your idea to do the JLA 10102. I don't envy your editing project, but uh, I do appreciate your moxie. This uh, set of comics was very important to me as a callow nine-year-old Canuck youth in a dusty prairie town, and it was my first introduction to the Vigilante and so many other characters that I loved, like Sandman, Wildcat, Shining Knight, and even the concept of an Earth 2, Green Arrow, and Speedy. And probably the first time I'd ever saw of a Metamorpho, and I was probably too young to appreciate what Zantana was bringing to the party. But from one uh, ancestral Scott to a couple of uh, homegrown fellers, thanks very much, and uh, plum honored that you could bring me in for this little hoot and nanny. Signing off from your favorite knucklehead cowboy, Ranger Gord. And we have to mention Chuck as Green Arrow because Chuck sent us a photograph of himself, which we may have posted on socials by now, actually. Yes. As Green Arrow. And it's phenomenal. You know, yeah, going the extra mile. Incarnate, quite frankly. Love you, Chuck. Yeah, this is uh, Chuck Lordens, and I'll be playing the part of Earth One Green Arrow in the story. And my first introduction to this story was I was given a box of comics when I was a kid, comics that were around before I started reading them and uh, it just had the one issue justice league of America number 101. So I just got one part of the story and it would be decades before I had a chance to uh, read the whole story in an anthology. One of the, uh, one of the big black and white reprints uh, showcase justice league. And since I've gotten it in one of the uh, color editions crisis on multiple earths, volume three, Anyway, it's a really fun comic, and what's funny is it has been referenced in uh, the Stargirl television series, season three, and it's been referenced recently in the comic books, uh, doing a little retcon on Green Arrow, saying that both Green Arrows in this story were now the same guy. You can look into this further if you want to, but anyway, this has been a lot of fun. 
So yes, thanks to everyone, obviously, that did extra voices for us. Because, you know, Pete and I could have attempted to do every single character just (laughs) ourselves. But it would have really stretched us to our limit, I think, to try and make them all sound differently. And even just the virtue of getting other folk to do other characters Mm -hmm. lifts it. But the fact that everyone took it so seriously and really went for it just really, really helps as well. I can't wait to hear it all properly. (laughs) Over a week before I can even hear part one listeners. (laughs) And speaking of going for it, we had Gavin Ritza coming back as the Thunderbolt in this chapter, which is great. He added an extra zing to the dialogue, which is fantastic. Yep. Cheers, Gav. Gav actually painted himself pink. Most of the Coddery's lines went full method on it. So check out the photographs of that that we might put on the socials. And he gelled his hair up into lightning bolts as well. <laughs> wow, which can is you exciting. imagine? Yeah. That would look amazing. Yeah. Gav, you probably won't listen to this for about three months, but you should try that. It'd be really funny. You should do it. <laughs> we'll take a picture and we'll yes. put it on the socials. Yes. <laughs> actually, it's worth pointing out that Canary doesn't really get much to do in this. No. She's not very well served, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. I mean, there should have been probably a point of her using her Canary cry to blast back some of the well, some martial arts, some skills. of the natives. I mean, yeah. she you do see her flipping a couple of guys over, but yeah, but it seems like she's minimal. only really just there to stand up for herself and to palm off these two guys that are kind of fighting her over at the start. Yeah, I would have liked it more if she'd had a bit more, you know, of a, a climatic canary scream to maybe free Ranger God from the mm-hmm. from the stake or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Instead of a, an arrow, I don't know. Because of course, Black Canary did first debut in the Golden Age in a Johnny Thunder story yes. and basically took over Johnny Thunder's yeah. strip in Flash yeah. Comics. Yeah. He was phased out after a few because he thought, oh, she's a much more popular character. Yeah. Let's get rid of Johnny. He's he's on the wane. So, so yeah. And of course, at this point in the story, she's in a relationship with Oliver. So it's inter- it's it's a nice touch of lens to actually address that. Mm-hmm. It's probably the only characters he really could do that with, actually. Yeah, it's to true. Be honest. So um, it's nice, but I would have liked a little mm-hmm. bit more superhero weeks from from Canary. We'll see what happens. So the yeah. next chapter, he told me, was much easier to edit after the last one. Yeah, because with all the guest voices, to just a peek behind the curtain, we actually recorded placeholder dialogue for every single character, just so it's easier for me to edit the lines in and out. And uh, obviously, with so many people being involved in the last chapter, that took a considerable amount of time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this one was a lot more straightforward. <laughs> Yes, because it was the only dialogue was really Wildcat, Aquaman, and, and Green Lantern, mm, and mm-hmm. Gav was doing Green Lantern, and Brandon gave us his under the weather, not very well, Star Spangled Kid acting. Yes, which was a lot of fun. Which is epic. Yes, Brandon gave us was it four or five takes of each each of his lines. Yeah, he gave us plenty of material to work from. <laughs> plenty of options to choose so, from. Yes. Uh-huh. So thanks for that, Brandon. It was great. We'll definitely get you back if, if you're up for it. It's like, how under the weather is Star Spangled Kid? Hmm, is he? Or is he just being, you know, a bit of a brat? Or is he, you know, just really, really struggling? Or, yeah. yeah. It was great. It was a full on, the full on <laughs> spectrum of acting there. When the Blu-ray special edition of this comes out in 10 years time, maybe all, all of Brandon's outtakes will be the, will be a bonus feature. If we, <laughs> if we ever do a Patreon, we can always put up all the original dialogue for you to hear and you, then yes. you can edit your own episode that'd together. be fun you could hear the amount of swearing <laughs> that ross and i do whenever we make mistakes yes. that'd be fun you keep, keep that for earth 2 podcast night that would get us struck completely Our spin-off show again another chapter where green arrow gets to do some fun power ring stuff wildcat gets to have a fight and aquan gets to do some swimming you found some interesting stuff online for this chapter didn't you yes was well, it indeed i mentioned earlier on how i'd found um the spanish reprints of this story and Wildcat's battle with the caveman was the focus for part three of the Spanish reprint. Part one was an adaptation of the the panel where all the heroes are flying through the void towards Oracle, and then mm-hmm. for part two they had a segment, uh, an, an illustration, sorry, of of Sir Justin and Superman sort of fighting in midair. But yeah, Wildcat battling the caveman, but the caveman had been recolored, so you'll have seen that on the socials by now. So the caveman had black hair in the original story, mm-hmm. but he's blonde on the cover of Ooh. the Spanish reprint. So make of that what you will. There we are. So yeah, check that out if you haven't done already. So that takes us to the, the final chapter, mm-hmm. starring Flash, Zatanna, and the Red Tornado. Indeed. And we had two people close to us joining us for this one. We had your sister. Yep. And we had my wife. Hey! Hey! Yeah, so... Um, Thank you to Ali and Christine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ali did her best Nicola Bryant off of Doctor Who voice for Santana. <laughs> it wasn't deliberate initially, but that's who she found she was doing, so she just went with it. And Christine went for a majorly authoritative Cersei, which is fantastic. Which I've not heard yet at this You've point. not heard yet? You, you wouldn't mess. <laughs> I wouldn't mess with Christine if I, <laughs> anyway, man. <laughs> Christine's cool. I know, you know, I'm glad she's on my side. I wouldn't want it not to be. But no, it was, this was a fun one because my voice is really going by this point. 
And I had to do Red Tornado. <laughs> and I had to... Um, Listen to me doing Red Tornado. Yes, and I had to try and be the Flash <laughs> and still have some energy in it, despite the fact that I was losing my voice completely. Because we recorded we recorded JLE's 100, 101 and 102. We recorded our bits on the same day. I know. <laughs> We're insane. Great idea. <laughs> Listeners, if you listen back to that particular chapter, listen to David's flash dialogue and just picture the actor Martin Landau. It's not what I was going for. If anything, I was trying to make him a little bit Ezra Miller without making him too Ezra Miller. <laughs> and of course, by this point, the Flash movie has been released and we both enjoyed it. Yes, yeah, so I loved it thoroughly. Yes. I, I liked it a lot up until that closing scene at the courthouse, which just left me frustrated and unsatisfied. But apart from that, I thought it was excellent. I thought Ezra was tremendous. Both I of them. I loved it. Even the end. It was great seeing Michael Keaton being a proper superhero Batman and loved the new Supergirl. So yeah, what did Mm -hmm. you think of the Flash movie, listeners? If you didn't like it, we don't want to know. But if you did, please (laughs) tell us what you liked about it. The final seven soldiers to be rescued, of course, was Speedy. Mm -hmm. Voiced by my friend and colleague, Logan McFarlane. Now, good thing about that, Logan's 19 at this point when we recorded it. So instead of either Peter or I, or maybe even Steve, (laughs) middle-aged man attempting to sound like a, a teenage superhero, we got a teenage superhero to do the voice. So that was good. Thank you, Logan. Much appreciated. Try and get you back at some point, I'm sure. Even though the dialogue was just, what's happening? I don't understand any of this. Oh, I bet he owned it. <laughs> it's, it's the, Logan is now the definitive speedy, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, like, any time I read a story, and that's what I'm going to hear. Stay off the heroin, Logan. It's not going to yes. be good. Yes. It's not going to oh, be good for God's sake. You. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> Other drugs are available. Yes. The less said about that, the better. The final <laughs> panel of page 18, then, or the big panel, shows all of the accumulated heroes, everyone recovered and restored and back in the present day. And it's fascinating to look at because, mm-hmm. honestly, the first time I read this story, I would have just gone, all right, cool, there's everyone. But looking at it now with a bit of 21st century perspective, yeah, there's an awful lot of white faces, isn't there? Yes, I'm entirely with you. Uh-huh. You know, Pete and I talked about this vaguely. We're not going to make a mm-hmm. big deal about it, but if this was happening nowadays, if they're retelling this story nowadays, yeah. you know it would be the John Stewart Green Lantern. Mm-hmm. It might be it might be the Val Zod Superman. Maybe Mikey Holtz, Master Terrific, would be there somehow. I don't know. Yeah, he would it's, definitely be in, yeah. It's really just the way things were at the time, all, the, all these characters, but it's just the sort of thing mm-hmm. you notice now. It's when you read a, a sort of a 60s Legion of Superheroes story and you notice that they're, yeah. apart from the people who are blue and green, everyone else is white. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's not a criticism. It's just one of these social history it's, observations. It's interesting from the you know from the historical point of view. And yeah, it's good to see how things have changed as well. Absolutely, there are a number of characters there that would have legacy versions. You know, mm-hmm. of different races, obviously, like Beth Chapel or Connor Hawk. Mm-hmm. The version of the Crimson Avenger that popped up in first of all in Stars and Stripes and appeared in GSA. You know, one, I hope I'm not overstating it, but it's interesting just to bear in mind as another cultural sort of yes point. Going back to the actual image here, we've got the Earth 2 Green Arrow standing directly behind the Earth 1 Green Arrow, and they don't interact at all. I know. Now, going up to present day, in current continuity, the Seven Soldier Green Arrow was the current Green Arrow. Yes. Displaced in time. Yeah. Which means that he's rescued himself. We haven't touched on that before. Yeah. And this is fascinating. Yeah. We've talked before how the the recent Stargirl series, mm-hmm. Stargirl The Lost Children, which we loved. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ross also covered that on Stop This Team Up. So yes. You can go and check out that if you feel like it. One of the, the tricks sort of in the, the holiday special that came out two years ago, before you know, a good long time before the series started, was mm-hmm. when it was sort of revealed that the Golden Age Green Arrow and Speedy were the Modern Age Green Arrow and Speedy just displaced in time, which was mind-blowing. Yes. Quite frankly. Many people were irate at it, but we both quite enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it was I think it's a genius move. It's uh-huh. it's the most straightforward and simple and it ties into the fact that Ollie has a line in, in the Star Girl Spring Break special where he says something about um Roy having trouble. Yeah. And obviously mm-hmm. it readjusting. There's a suggestion back, yeah. that Roy's readjustment is maybe what made him like, you know, think about taking drugs and okay. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. The good sort of retroactive sort of continuity sort of stuff, rather than just saying that this character is the same surname as this character, let's make them relatives. This character is the daughter of this character, let's say, yeah. Mm. Uh The one I've moaned about in the past about Robot Man's laboratory assistant having the same surname as as Dick Grayson, so Roy Thomas made them relatives. When you sort of think, surely then if he was his uncle, he would have adopted him? You would think, yes. And And said he's thinking, no, it's fine, I'll just let this reclusive millionaire adopt him. It's in... no, no. Yeah, not into it. I'm too but, busy, you know, doing robotic experiments yeah. with, uh, with my pal who is a brain yeah. in a metal suit. Yeah. Mm. Mm. The 40s kids don't, just don't do it. But the, inter- <laughs> the other interesting thing, obviously, about the Stargirl miniseries was that Wing had such a big focal point on it. Yes. And a really, mm. really poignant ending where he kind of went to meet his ultimate fate. He didn't sort of chicken mm-hmm. out all of it. He didn't 
because he knew that his destiny was to die. It was phenomenal. Yeah, yep. uh-huh. fighting, destroying the Nebula Man, and we've preempted the last couple of pages of the story with yeah. that. But you know, it's, it finishes with an image of Wing. But we're you know, I'm quite happy to admit that I welled up at that. Oh, I did too. Genuinely, it's like wow, yeah. I can't believe this is happening. It was uh, yeah, very emotional, and very well told, great artwork as well as as, yeah. uh, as as the script. Yeah, unconditional recommend mm-hmm. on Star the Lost Child. There must be a collected version of it due soon. I would think. Yeah, it will be out at some point. Huh? I would yeah. hope so. That will probably be out before the next issue of GSA at this rate. Yeah, God, when was the last issue of the GSA? <laughs> I can't even remember. So yeah, we've preempted the part, the fact that in the next part of the, the story, Mr. Terrific Robin and Green Lantern return from the Himalayas and Crimson Avenger confirms that Wing was the unknown soldier of victory. Mm-hmm. He had died fighting Nebula Man and Green Lantern, ably played by Brandon, reiterates the fact that the monument was there and, and that he's well remembered. Then the Iron Hand pops yep. up, taking uh, Diana hostage. Mm. And then we've got the brilliant fake out from Diana Prince. And she acts all, oh, I'm going to fade too. Yes. And then she becomes all major karate badass. Yep. It's superb. It really is. That's she... exactly what you want. Considering she's been hanging around waiting on everyone all this time, she gets a glorious moment at the end. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. But also, at the end, she karate chops the Iron Hand's hand off and he says, my mechanical hand, you've severed it. And she says, consider yourself lucky. I could have done that to your neck. Flash forward to Maxwell Lord much <laughs> later on, and she does break his neck in an attempt to stop a mind-controlling Superman. A couple of decades later, let's be honest. We don't talk about the 2000s much, really. <laughs> I don't like to think about some of the things that went on. Like, you know, it's obviously, you know, our, our colleague Shag Matthews with his JLI podcast, he quite often refers to some of the, the horrible things that were done to the JLI characters mm, yeah. in the 2000s. You know, mm. Death of Ted Cord, Max oh. going evil, and I, to this, yeah. I'm just like... Oof. I'm not a fan. No, I just find it fascinating that that's a line here. You yeah, know, and it's, it's nice it's, to see her being oh. such a badass. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh, I, you know, I believe that she would have done it. And of course, Iron Hand then tells everyone that the controls to, to switch off the big giant space hand were in his hand. Well, that's just stupid. Or something. Doesn't he have a backup? Well, you'd think. Maybe mm. a hard copy in a file somewhere, but then... Yeah. Dr. Fate suggests that the, the device that they used to destroy the Nebula Man could be reconstructed, which gave Brandon another chance to dazzle as Sylvester. Which is cool. And it's, again, it's big science exposition speech that he had, so it's quite mm-hmm. good. <laughs> I like the little montage shot of them all reassembling and Sylvester passing the weapon on to Superman. You've got Superman. to love a montage. Yeah. And the GLs. That one probably made it onto the socials, I'm sure. Then we have the big plot twist at the end. Yes. Where, you know, who is going to carry this thing up to destroy the hands? And Superman says he'll do it because he's invulnerable to everything. And then Dr. Fate zaps him, saying, but not magic. Yes, Dr. Fate, still 10, 11 years after he came back here, still gesturing with lightning bolts. No sign of the Egyptology imagery. Nope, still not yet. mark that out. It's still not happening. Unless he did read that advert from the previous issue that had the ank symbol on it. And he thinks, That's true. Mm-hmm. Well, it's actually, when I was talking about Stars and Stripe issue 9, it's a, it's an ank-shaped portal that the heroes use to return to the present ah, day. okay. Which is interesting. Yeah, okay. So anyway. And then, of course, the two Green Lanterns say they can both go because the power rings will protect them from the blast. And Green Arrow rocks up with this yellow wooden arrow. He says, this could take down either of you. And it's like, why does he have a yellow wooden well, arrow? Well, just in case one of them goes or they both go. I mean, mm. a, a yellow wooden arrow accommodates to both your weaknesses. I mean, if I suppose that if it, yeah, the yellow aspect would probably penetrate a force shield if Al had it. And if it, because it's made of wood, it would... Take, it would take Alan down. The Shining Knight also says his armour wouldn't just protect him from destruction. Now listen, listen, hear me out. Why okay. doesn't Superman put on the Shining Knight's armour, get magically charged up by Dr. Fate and Power Beam charged up by the two Green Lanterns and fly off with this device? Well, would he be able to do it if he was wearing the magic armour? Would the magic armour sort of maybe interfere with his own abilities? No, I, don't I, don't, I, don't, I think magic armour is just protective to itself. Right, it's not going to affect the him. wearing it. Well, yeah, see, uh-huh. I don't know. I mean, I'd, so, yeah. my, my inclination would be to, to wonder whether or not his, his abilities would be affected, but, but that's, an, that's a thought. Well, then again, if he's been weakened, if, if the artist you know, at its current weakened state as opposed to the super Superman, mm. then perhaps, you know, he would be right. more vulnerable. And that's just his bravado saying he's invulnerable. Or maybe mm. Len hasn't been reading the pages of Superman, or maybe they've forgotten over the page. I mean, <laughs> the vagaries of Superman's powers at this point are just are, are legion, if you pardon the pun. Mm-hmm. And there's all sorts. Nice scene as Batman reads out Red Tornado's note. High which, drama, yeah. letter reading, yes. It's what we do here in the Earth 2 podcast. It's, I'm guessing that Reddy must have some kind of internal printer. <laughs> yeah, he, he did that very quickly. Uh, you know, uh, and it prints out and he blue tacks Dot it. Dot matrix, so. obviously, yes. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, the time to write it and be very emotive very quickly. Because as we said at the time we told the story, you can see him lurking and contemplating mm-hmm. in the background whilst the others 
decide what to do. It's a shame that not everyone got a line of dialogue towards the end, but I admire yeah. Len's restraint because it becomes that thing and it's been, I've seen this mocked in the past. It's mocked very, mocked very famously. I wish I could remember who it was by. I don't know if it was Mark Wade or someone like that. But it's really, I find it really distracting. Now, the first time I read it, I didn't think of it, but when I read Crisis and Infinite Earth these days, mm-hmm. I'm really struck by every time a character appears, another character refers to them by their superhero name. Yeah, uh-huh. to introduce them to the... Yeah, just to the reader, if they don't yeah. know them. I mean, it's useful when you're a fan, you don't know who this guy is that, that mm-hmm. so-and-so's talking to. But it, it was mocked very mercilessly in the world's funnest comic, mm-hmm. which had, you know, Mr. Mixoplex and Batmite fighting each other as they all tried... Yeah. People ended up being killed because they were spending too much time <laughs> saying the names of other heroes to try and warn them to get out of the way. Um, you know... Wildfire, Firehawk, fire, oh, you know, that that sort of thing. I'm I'm glad that not every single person got a line. Quite frankly, it's nice to have that moody shot yeah. on page twenty three when you see Aquaman and Stripes. He's sort of standing listening. Yeah, I mean, they could have gone round the entire room and sort of said, "Well, I can't do it because of this, or I can't do it. I'm just a cowboy, or I could I could, <laughs> I could turn into neon gas and I would be all right." No, shush, metamorpho, metamorpho. Actually, he probably would. Be Met- right, yeah. Doctor Fate probably could have done it. Yeah, you know, uh-huh. I mean, for all the fa- all the saying that Doctor Fate wouldn't, you know, can stop could have stopped Superman. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Doctor Fate could have done it. But anyway, there is a massive explosion, and hopefully, mm. hopefully, Peter was able to put a massive explosion sound effect over it. I don't know. We'll don't find out. It. It's fine. And Superman, Starman, and Doctor Fate all get one last line of dialogue as they go off and have a look. And the fact, actually, the final page, page twenty-four, is another one that was reformatted for the reprint in the di- all right. the digest. Mm-hmm. I will look at it now to remind myself. A bit more sky added above our man in the crimson. A bit more added to the bodies of Hawkman and Aquaman and three flying heroes respaced okay. and stretched out a little bit more at the top and the bottom for the final panel. But again, mm. I'll put that on the socials, listeners, so you can have a look and do a comparison for your own self. And the final panel that shows... Very poignantly. Red Tornado on wing waving down from the clouds. Yeah, wing. Metaphorically. Who doesn't get a single line of dialogue in the whole no. story. Do you not think it might be more interesting if if it was the Crimson Avenger who sacrificed himself and wing came back and became the new Crimson Avenger? Or if Wing was somehow magically restored at this point and mm-hmm. then whilst they were all squabbling, took it off and fulfilled his destiny. Like in Stargirl. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, more or less. Okay. That, you know, when Alan and Lee are sort of talking about it and con- Lee confirms that Wing had died, it would be nice if there'd been a tiny little flashback panel at that point. I mean, it, that page is excellent, the way it's cropped mm-hmm. down the panel of, of Crimson sort of saying what happened. It doesn't take up the full page, yeah. the full width it's cropped uh-huh. in. It gives it a, little, a nice little focus. It really draws the eye. Yeah, They could have maybe taken one more panel out of Diana's court. Maybe they couldn't play his room, but they could have cut mm-hmm. the next panel with Green Lantern in half and maybe shown an image of Wing. I don't know. It's, mm. it's weird that he's only really in that one panel. Yeah. And of course, it brings us to the whole big can of worms that is, why were they called the Seven Soldiers of Victory? I mean, the Lost Legionnaires title is also what they were known as. That's yeah. perfectly valid. It's, yeah. it's really this story that cements that as their name, because sure. it did flip sure. between the, both names in, sure. in the Golden Age. But this story really cements them as the Seven Soldiers of Victory, which is very problematic I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of that. It's, you, it's exciting, mean, it's exciting yeah. as the Seven Soldiers of Victory is. Nice and alliterative. Do you mean the yeah. fact that it reduces this minority character to a kind of, to, to not being there? Yeah, yeah. To, yeah, to yeah be, I agree. Mm-hmm. I know what you mean. You know, I mentioned earlier on, like, reading through the Seven Soldiers archives in preparation, mm-hmm. and the way that Wing is portrayed in those stories compared mm-hmm. to that detective comic story we, we did, did a few, few weeks, weeks ago, ago yeah. Jinx, mm-hmm. it's abhorrent. Uh-huh. He, he goes from being a capable adult Yeah to this horribly caricatured pigeon English speaking joke character almost yeah. it's, it's you know it's it's one of these it's of its time and we can't excuse it even though it's of its time but mm-hmm. you know Pete and I in an idle conversation speculated that maybe that this was another member of the family yeah. or a brother mm-hmm. or a son or a nephew or something because he's yep. so much clearly so much younger than the guy that you see in the, the early detective comic stories yeah, I mean, it, the whole seven, it's become a bit of a running joke, isn't it? You have to make up the numbers every time it's retconned. Exactly. And it was retconned again. And we talked about the Stars and Stripe retcon, but um, issue two of the DC Universe Legacies series, which was mm-hmm. published during 2010. Ollie and Roy are replaced by TNT and Dan the Dynamite. Which I really don't like, because I love the idea of this team basically being made up of non-powered people. Yeah. Uh, even, although yeah. Sir Justin's got his magical armor and enchantments, they're uh-huh. pretty much all... Just guys. Yeah. Yeah. Just Ordinary people who are doing the good, fighting the good fight. Absolutely. And, you know, Danny and TNT, it's not like they're sort of Superman no. powered level or, no. you know, but it's still, you're right. It's it still powers, a, yeah. I mean, the, the story in, in the backup strip in DC Universe Legacy 2, the, the variant cover mm-hmm. features the this new Seven Soldiers, and again, there's eight of them yeah. <laughs> on the cover. That's That has them coming against Black Star, who's who they, mm-hmm. the, the villain they fight in issue two of leading comics. Mm-hmm. The dummy turns up as well. 
and you realise that the dummy is not actually a dummy, it's just a, a wee guy, which is fascinating. It's weird how they, as you say, the, the numbers have got to be made up. And at this point, TNT and, and Danny the Dynamite, they're not the most demonstratively sort of, you know, Superman level powers or, mm-hmm. you know, Flash level powers or anything. Yeah. But it does kind of take away from the, I mean, I've always liked the kind of more urban sort of non-powered characters. Yeah, definitely. But as you say, they were trying to make up the numbers and it's quite a good pairing to use. Yeah, the dynamic certainly is, yeah. It's quite an interesting sort of way of replacing Green Arrow and Speedy is, you know, a, a tied heroes with similar powers and similar costumes but of course as we said already like um the latest retcon is that it was green arrow and speedy all along you know that's post zero hour post crisis post zero post final crisis post new 52 post convergence post, post dark crisis yeah. post metal whatever mm-hmm. the final issue of lost children finished with courtney being mentioned as being in i think three separate super teams so hopefully we'll see some more of that revived seven soldiers and hopefully we'll see Yay. some more of all of the, the kid sidekicks that were restored at the end of that story mm-hmm. so Shall we do the letters for issue 102 then? Let's do this. Let's jump ahead to the GLA mailroom from issue 105. And the first letter says, Dear Editor, Justice League of America 102 was a pleasure to read. And this is high praise indeed coming from one who abhors continued stories and is bored by the exploits of the Justice Society. Get out. <laughs> get, get out of our podcast yes. don't let the door hit your backside <laughs> as you leave yes Len Wein constantly amazes me only a handful of writers could have taken what I view as a losing premise and moulded it into a really fine story it was evident throughout this series that you were resurrecting some old and sadly outdated heroes the Star Spangled Kid would be laughed off the street these days <sighs> okay If anyone else had handled the writing, I would have dismissed the series as a hack job and something of a cop-out. Len Wein handled it beautifully. The little character sketches and snatches of conversation were great. The argument over Black Canary was well worth the price of admission. The same goes for Thunderbolt's timely, if delayed, appearance. These are the details that round out a mag. The ones that help establish a tone for it. Strange, isn't it, that each member of the Soldiers of Victory was involved in a potentially dangerous situation with, even more strangely, historically famous personalities at the exact moment that the combined forces of the GLA GSA went out to find him. But it wouldn't have been a three-parter if our guys had just been able to swoop down the passages of time, pick up their respective heroes and return instantaneously. It wouldn't have been much of a story either. Zatanna's amazing control of her wings struck this reader as a bit far-fetched. But I won't quibble. A long time ago, in a junior high school English class, I was taught a handy little phrase. Suspension of disbelief. It applies especially well to the comics, with an X, magazine universe. After all, how believable is a girl who can make carpets fly simply by speaking to them backwards? And how does she manage to pronounce some of those words anyhow? Retornado's selfless sacrifice was presented with an unnecessary dose of misty-eyed sentimentality. What?! He died. Of course, mm. people are going to go say, oh. It, d- <laughs> it does get a mate tiring watching all these superheroes vying for a chance to sacrifice themselves to save humanity and or their colleagues every other month. A final word about the cover. Surely you noticed that while everyone was gazing ardently at Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman had eyes only for each other. Coincidence? And that is from Susan Breckman from Spring Valley, New York. Yeah, we didn't really discuss too much. I mean, I think at the time I, when we did the story, I expressed my disgust at Flash and Ray Tornado tonight in a part more than part snail, but we didn't yeah. really talk too much about... No, yeah, no. But no, it was, I thought it was really quite resourceful of Zatanna to kind of mm-hmm. come up with another way of yeah. communicating. And The fact it was a hummingbird means there is a noise coming yeah. over. It was great. So, you know, it's... Uh, hmm. Obviously, and in, in the, the correspondent there picked up on what I'd said about the cover, because Julie Schwartz's editorial response to that one is coincidence by design of artist Nick Cardi. So there we go, he knew exactly yeah. what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Wonder Woman of E2 clearly taken with Batman of E1. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. The second and final letter covering this story. Dear Editor, welcome everyone to DC's Gavel to Gavel coverage of the 1972 annual superhero convention. Open brackets, JLA 100 to 102. As we come into the third and concluding round, we see Superman on the cover of 102 making the motion to nominate this issue's casualty. After the delegates from both Earths meet on page 18 to begin a caucus, those of the League and Society proclaim the result. It's wing in the first ballot. A running mate? Sure! It's the Red Tornado. The convention all but over. The collection of capes, cowls, masks and the light paws for the famous somewhere, somehow, fade out and the marathon is over. Well, that's a bit cynical, isn't it? <laughs> Fellow readers, 
Let us not be critical of the fact that the menace took three issues to track and trail was mashed into a potato by a few jabs from Diana Prince. Let us forgive Nick Cardy for his portrayal of Black Canary in the cover when she looks like something out of H.P. Lovecraft's shadow over Innsmouth. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> oh my goodness. We must ask ourselves, what was Len Wein's intention, his purposeful goal? If it was merely to provide an entertaining wonderama of supermen and superwomen in action, teamed with each other and launched against various worthy, for the most part, threats, I think he succeeded. I was entertained by Mr Wien's selection of fighting teams, especially Black Canary, Green Arrow and Johnny Thunder. His humorous interjections, his way of creating problems that were not too obviously tailored to his character's powers, an exception, open brackets, was that flood that burst in Aquaman, yeah, yes we thought so, handy. and his way of avoiding crowding while including so many heroes. Let me make one thing perfectly clear. I think Len did a good job. And that's another letter from David Dash, Brooklyn, New York. Julie's response. Even though your final sentence said it all, we enjoyed your lengthy lead-in to the sum-up. He's obviously mocking this, I suppose, the slightly sentimental ending, but... It needs it. I think it works mm. really well because you've got that little bit of dialogue between our man and the Crimson Avenger. Yeah. Obviously reunited after time and decades and memories because they mm. mostly know each other because they're comfortable speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's very poignant. It's, it's, it I, th- I think Steve and I played it very poignantly as well. <laughs> and of course, Retornado died. I mean, we never saw him again. He was he was never back. That was the end of that character forever and ever and ever. I wish I had been. <gasps> Do I really mean that? He, it's not like he was back, just like in a couple of issues' time. I know. <laughs> is it? And indeed, the star on the cover in a couple of issues' I know. time. It's, I think because he, he does was it the, yeah he it's does reappear on the final I panel of yeah. the, the final page of one hundred five and yeah is in issue one hundred six. Mm-hmm. Obviously, listeners, we're not too far away from issues one hundred seven and one hundred eight, so we'll maybe give you a brief summary of one hundred six when we get there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have a plan to cover issue one hundred three, but we're going to do that later in the year. Oh yes, at a particular calendar date. Indeed. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you see? So the seven soldiers. So what was your favourite chapter out of all that, do you think? I like the Batman, Starman, and Man one because I have a kind of fondness for the retelling. And But I also like I like the, the Green Arrow, yeah. Robin Hood. Tenure. I like them all, to be honest. Uh-huh. I, I find it hard to be dismissive of any of them because Len has done a really good job. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can pick a least favourite because there's yeah. always something interesting, be it the combination of heroes that is remarkable mm-hmm. or... I mean, you get to the you get to the Zatanna and Speedy and Flash yeah. and Retinator one, and it's a bit wordy and a bit complicated. But uh-huh. I'm, I kind of admire Len's ability to not just phone in the last chapter. Yeah, because the the Star Spangled Kid, Aquaman, Green Lantern, Wildcat mm-hmm. one that's probably the, the most straightforward. Definitely, definitely. That's the kind of pause for breath, and I think you know if it, if it was a movie version, mm-hmm. you know, the centerpiece of that would be the fight and yeah. then the floods. You know, so there's a bit of drama, mm-hmm. but. What's your favourite? It's a coin toss between two of them, really. It's the Vigilante chapter because I just love the characterisation of Johnny, G.A. and Dinah. Mm-hmm. I think that's just fantastic and well played by everyone involved as well. Yes. And that and the Robin Hood chapter, which weirdly doesn't have Robin Hood in it, which yes. is a complete wasted opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's so bizarre. And it also, none of the other Merry Men. I mean, it would been fun if, as you said, if it was Green Arrow who was Robin Hood all this time. But also, you know, if Speedy was with him and was Will Scarlet. Of course, you know so that, that must be... have been done in a story before yeah. now, or is Jeff going to do it in this revitalised Seven Soldiers? There have been several meetings of Green Arrow, Golden Age Green Arrow, and uh, Robin Hood. Several connections that I've been looking into. So we might do something ah. with that at some point yeah, okay. in the future. Well, might, she'll, might. She'll see no more at this time. Yeah. Then. No, it's interesting. I, mean, I think I think the whole three parts. Mm-hmm. I think it reads better if you read it all in one go because that first oh. chapter with Doctor Fate and Ralph is is almost tacked on at the end of all the intro. And it's kind of, but I mean, as exciting as with the Crimson and the battle and the inside the pyramid and all that sort of stuff, or the temple, I should say. And I think it's overall it's it's paced very well. Mm-hmm. The recaps by both Diana and Oracle. And Oracle, we haven't done this. Oracle who doesn't come back at the end. No, he doesn't. We meant to talk. We should have talked about that earlier. <laughs> Oracle who doesn't come back at the end to kind of say, "Well, well done, everyone. I'm going home now." <laughs> <laughs> You've done a great job. You know, that's yeah. um, that's mm-hmm. surprising. He, Oracle never comes back, does he? Oracle does not show up in any way, shape or form. There's lots of these cosmic entities that appear for this one story. Yeah. And the thing is, Marvel were doing this sort of thing at the same time, except they would use Eternity or they would, use, they would keep reusing the same ones, whereas yeah. DC brought them out pretty much as one shots. Think of all the big giant cosmic entities that the Spectre encounters. Exactly. And they're all pretty much one shots. Yeah, I mean, Oracle in some ways could almost you can imagine the Spectre fulfilling Oracle's role in this story yeah. quite easily. Oh God, yeah, huh? That'd be amazing. You can imagine you must know, summon the spirit of the Spectre we, we must, from beyond. But he's forbidden mm-hmm. to interfere. He can only mm-hmm. 
direct yeah. them and help. That would have been actually quite interesting. That would have been great. Yeah, that would have. Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't it. you think of that, Mister Lynn? Because mm. I mean, we're only the crow flies. We're not too far away from the spec they're coming back in Adventure Comics. Spoilers. So yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we think of that when we get there. But yeah, the Seven Soldiers will also return mm-hmm. in the pages of Adventure Comics because there's a previously unpublished Golden Age story which was serialised over a few issues of Adventure. So we're going to do that when it comes to it. And of course, yeah. Vigilante is going to pop up a couple more times very yes. soon. The, yeah. well, the Earth One Vigilante. What we've established is the Earth One mm-hmm. Vigilante. But, you know, the Seven Soldiers, they, we didn't really see much more of them until All-Star Squadron. There were a couple of other Seven Soldiers lineups that we should mention. The glorious DC Comics Silver Age event, published during May 2000, had an issue within that, as well as it's Doom Patrol and Challengers and JLA and Robbie Reed teaming up with John Johns. I had an issue of Showcase, which was called Showcase Presents Seven Soldiers of Victory, and that the new team featuring Dead Man, Black Hawk, Metamorpho, Batgirl, Adam Strange, Mento, Pal of the Doom Patrol, and the new version of the Shining Knight, who was basically based on Gardner. Is it Gardner Grail? Is that his name? Yes. Who was the, the Atomic Knight, uh-huh. or one of the Atomic Knights. Mm-hmm. Um, this sort of new team using that name was set up to kind of fight some bad guys. It was never seen again, of course. But then... Yes. Around about the time that the, the Weekly 52 series was being published, mm-hmm. in 2005, there was Grant Morrison's fabled Seven Soldiers event where he used versions of The Guardian, Zatanna, different Mr. Miracle, Clarion, Bomb, 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 The Witch Boy, mm-hmm. and a few others to tell a wide-ranging story, which I have to admit I haven't read. Well, I didn't read it when it came out, so I got the trades when they were first released, and I read it, and that was a long time ago, and I can't remember much about it, apart from the fact I did enjoy it. I remember the premise being the fact that this evil entity could only be defeated by a team of seven, but they could defeat them if the seven were together, and basically it's... It's seven interlocking stories. Yes. They can all be read independently, but there's slight, slight crossover events and it sure. has a domino effect that ends up with the bad guy being defeated. Right. It has been a while since I've read it, so yeah. I'm doing it, definitely doing it a disservice. Yeah, 18 but, years ago. But it was really interesting. I remember, I remember things, I'm a big fan of J.H. Williams who drew the, mm. the intro issue, mm-hmm. and I remember trying to read the first part, stalling it, but I did read a couple mm. of issues of some of the miniseries, but just for yeah. whatever reason... I haven't got around to reading the whole thing. I have dug them all out, though. Mm -hmm. So maybe galvanised by this series of episodes, I will take a look at them. I'll probably put some of the covers up on the socials over the next week or so as well. I think the standout for me was probably the Clarion chapters, because it's Fraser Irving doing the art and that. It's just so amazing. Clarion, bomb, 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 the witch boy. Yep. I wish there was more stuff by him, I'll be honest. Every time I see his name in something, I have to read it. He did a ridiculous Origin of Skeletor issue of Masters of the Universe. Oh, right. And it was hideous and beautiful at the same time. It's Gosh. phenomenal, yeah. It was just a one-shot, then. yeah. Huh? Right, if you've got it, it dig really it good. That sounds fun. Yeah, definitely someone worth checking out. And yeah, yeah The Seven Soldiers Victory. And also, it's one of these things that you kind of have to read it in publication order. They do a sure. good job of putting the stories in order. Of how they should be read in the yes, trades. Yes. Because you sh- it's not like you need one mini series, then you need another mini series. There's hints of one thing in one yeah. story that leads on to something in another yeah. story. But as I said, these things are all mostly in the background and you can read and enjoy the mini series all on their own. It's yeah. very cleverly designed. Yeah. There's a reading order in the back of the Zero issue, I think. Mm-hmm. We should also mention very quickly that the Seven Soldiers did pop up in the Stargirl TV series, yes. which was obviously the inspiration that we, we asked Steve to take into account when he was playing Stripesy. Mm-hmm. I don't think we ever saw them all walking about in live action, but it was a photograph of the team, yeah. which was nice, and, and you know, Justin obviously appeared. Yeah. It was so cool seeing some of the characters come to life in the Stargirl show. I remember that this, the episode that started with Johnny Thunder and Wildcat, and I just thought I'd died and got to heaven, quite frankly. <laughs> Stargirl, such a shame that it's gone. Anyway. They have appeared in animation, haven't they? As in Brave well, yeah. and Bold. Uh, so, well, a few of them obviously Just appeared in, in Just League Unlimited. And you will have seen by now, listeners, that I've put some of their appearances up on the socials over the last couple of weeks. They did a, th- a really interesting approach to the Crimson in JLU, where they basically had him as an old guy in the original costume that Lee wore. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, because as you, know, as you probably know, that Crimson Avenger dies at some point in the early 80s. Spoilers, but we'll get to that in a long time. Yes. But the kind of the JLU version kind of basically went, went with well, what if he hadn't? <laughs> and there's an excellent issue of Just League Unlimited, the, the tie in DC comic to the, to the Cartoon Network series, where uh-huh. you see a bit of his adult life in an old folks' home and stuff, and he's teamed up with Star Girl, and it's, and it's brilliant. And he pops up in a couple, and Vigilante's in at least one, and mm-hmm. the No Shining Knights in at least one as well. Posted a Vigilante cover a while ago when Vig, I think, first came back in the pages of Justice League, 78, 79. So. 
I won't be posting them again, but you will have seen by now the Crimson and the Shining Knights cover appearances on the socials by now. And if I can find anything else, I might stick that up. But yes, the socials. The socials. Speaking of them, if you want to find out where any of this stuff is, then you should check out the Earth 2 podcast at Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter. We're at podcast underscore Earth 2. You can also send us a voice message on SpeakPipe which our good friend Caitlin Higgins has done, based off the back of our first Road to the Seven Soldiers episode. Let's hear from Caitlin now. Hello, I am Caitlin Higgins, the daughter of Steve Higgins slash Jimmy Olsen, and I have several comments slash questions about the Seven Soldiers of Victory Part 1 episode. Number one, there was a lot of randomness A lot of menswear references that were very funny. Number two, there were a lot of white hats in the both the Crimson story and into the Vigilante story. Probably was confusing to read, but was also very funny. Number three, also in the Vig story, the character of George Smythe. I liked how Peter changed Joe Smythe's voice like as soon as he switched identities. And my very last question, also in the Vig story, where did Stuff get a crossbow from? He was just like swinging on a flagpole, went in through the window, went into the other room, and suddenly he has a crossbow. Where did he get it from? So those are all of my comments slash questions about the episode have a good day caitlin i think that basically the easiest option here was that there was a crossbone display in his room that also had the the armor that george Smythe leapt into that oh. makes sense that makes sense yeah and thank you for your compliments on my voice change yes yeah. <laughs> the face i did when he just i wasn't expecting pete to do that voice when he did george Smythe. anyway caitlin thank you anyone else wants to send us a, a, a voicemail message please do so that would be tremendous yeah, the link for that's on the show notes for this very episode and indeed all our episodes yep. is speakpipe.com forward slash the earth 2 podcast so we'll wind up again by thanking everyone who joined in and helped us out by providing extra voices for us to tell this epic story indeed yes you've all been amazing and yeah we might call on your talents at some point in the future we're so so grateful genuinely like going out your way to do it in some cases and just sort of some cases being harangued and to do it <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so, gra- I'm so glad and grateful that everyone did And obviously we've heard from a few people during the course of this episode their thoughts and stories. Be assured, listeners, when we get to Christ and Infinite Earths, we are not going to be doing every single line of dialogue with everyone being voiced by a different character because that would kill us. Don't you, don't just get that, get that idea out of your head right now. We, 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 we'll see how we get on. <laughs> but, you know, going forward, depending on, on the practicalities of it, we may get, we may do some more episodes where we, we have some guest voices. Obviously, there are other JLA, JSA crossovers with Cast of Thousands, so we'll see how we got on with those. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Time will tell. It always does on that bombshell. I've been Peter. And I've been David. We'll see you again next week for the seventh episode of the Seven Soldiers of Victory Summer, <laughs> a special bonus as we cover World's Finest 214. Until that time, you've been listening to The Earth, Earth 2, 2 Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter Cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime.